We apologize for the delay. I'm glad to see everyone here. <laughs> We're going to get started. Sorry for the delay. Thank you for coming tonight. Um, we're, this is the David Douglas School Board meeting on Thursday, April the 11, 2024. We are beginning at 7.12 p.m. And we want to get started with our Native American land acknowledgement. Today, we want to begin our meeting by acknowledging that we gather as David Douglas School District on the traditional land of the Multnomah, Wasco, Cowlitz, Claflamet, Clackamas, Bands of Chinook, Tualatin, Kalapuya, Malala, and many other tribes past and present who made their homes along the Columbia and Willamette Rivers and honoring with gratitude the land itself and the people who have stewarded it throughout the generations. We further want to again acknowledge the impact of the forced removal, violence, and attempted erasure of the lives and legacies of indigenous people, past and present, and to commit to creating an educational environment that honors indigenous history and contributions and encourages the continual pursuit of better stewardship of the land we inhabit as well. Um, there is an addition tonight, um, if you want more information, uh, particularly about the activities that go on in our own district, or um, even how to support uh, Native American efforts, you can use the QR code on the screen or the link. Thank you. And now we're going to have our student body president report. All right. Hi, my name is Micaiah. Just to reintroduce myself again, I am not Aaron. I'm covering for Aaron this month. And just to give our student council updates. Um, there hasn't been too much student council activity in the past month because of spring break. Um, but we have continued to plan for prom on the 26th of this month and have begun preparations for our Unite Week, which is the David Douglas High School's version of a multicultural week and that will take place in early May. Um, this week we hosted a lip sync battle during lunch for our students, and next week we're hosting a basketball tournament for our students called Scott's Madness. And recently we finished up our ASB elections, and we had around 20 students running to be new ASB officers, and we elected 10 new officers for next year. And along with that, we are currently interviewing for our class council, and we have 60 applicants for next year, and we assume to get around 30 from our middle schools. And that's about it. Great. Thank you. I'm curious if Principal Carradine or Superintendent Richardson were in the lip sync battle. <laughs> <laughs> no? Because... <laughs> <laughs> I would have paid money for that. <laughs> We're going to continue with our public comments tonight. And the first person is Heather. Just a second. Good evening. I am here on behalf of Title VI. My name is Heather Miller, and I am one of your family engagement specialists for the David Douglas School District. I am supporting Title VI, why a staff member has been on maternity leave, and I will continue to be supporting Title VI as a parent, too. I am part of the NAPAC um, Parent Advisory Group um, that supports our Title VI programs and then also our fellow students that are in our district. K through 12. I am here on behalf of being a proud parent to an eighth grader at Floyd Light who is coming to the high school this next year. He is also a NAEP uh, Title VI student, and he has been since we started the program here at David Douglas um, back in 2016. 
So it's been um, a process here at David Douglas for the last eight years. And I just want to thank you for giving me this time to explain that and then also share the, pra uh, we're in the middle of doing our current applications for the year of 2025, which is our current um, native population that has moved in or that has decided that yes, they do want to be part of the Title VI program. They see what David Douglas is doing and they would like to be a part of that. Um, being part of the Title VI program, they have to have a federally recognized tribe, either a parent themselves or grandparent to be a part of it for the application to go through the process. Um, it also is open to all local agencies and tribes. Here in Oregon, we have 40 and Douglas is one of those 40. We currently, um, we currently um, are looking at our Title VI requirements and these are selected by filling out 506 forms that this year we decided to spend a little extra money and we got paid in dividends. We got the highest number of applications that we have seen since the first application round in 2016. We got 55 returned, and what we did differently is we paid for uh, shipping. So essentially, we sent out the application to our new applicants that were highlighted. We sent them a self-addressed envelope, and we had them fill it out and mail it back to us if they were comfortable. We had 55 turned in, the highest number that we, again, have had since 2016, which is huge. Now, other... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm showing you on that slide. Thank you. Um, and just so you know, um, being part of the Title VI program, there is a lot of things that need to be accomplished. We also need to have a parent advisory group. And we do here at David Douglas, our parent advisory group is called NAPAC. We meet um, once a month and these are the uh, caregivers that decide what our objectives are going to be for the school year. And our NAPAC uh, families have decided that increasing cultural identity, identity and awareness and increased parent participation is number one in our caregivers, what they think and they want to quite a few people and we got the support and we figured out what needed to be happen and myself, my husband, and my two sons were one of the first families of the NAPAC program starting that here at David Douglas. And as you can see through the years, we've gone up in numbers. We did go down in numbers during COVID, but this year, like I said, we have 55. There is a question mark that you'll see up there next to it that is because we have turned in all applicants and we're waiting for the federal government to say yes, for sure you have 55 and you're good for next year. So we're just waiting for the part two to come back, which we're waiting to hear. Next slide. This slide is our testing for our Native American <coughs> students. I am actually gonna advance to the next slide and not talk about this one. I'm gonna go on and actually talk about our, um, with our numbers being higher, that has made our involvement in different communities more broader to where we've been able to bring different community members in and partners because of these bigger numbers and then also that means 
more caregiver, that means more tribes, that means more diversity and bringing things that this district has not seen, which has been, you know, like medicine bear. And we've been partnered with NEA, but now NARA's being a partner and then uh, Select's tribe has came about and so forth. And these are Native American partners. These are ran and supported by Native Americans. And that's the biggest thing about it is having um, partners that look like them and listen to them and know what their traditions and their culture are and they're a diverse program. We also are fortunate to have six David Douglas uh, staff that support Title VI um, this year. Next slide please. And I would like to give it to Jay. Thank you. Thank you, Heather. I don't know if Heather mentioned, but she is our new family engagement specialist. Um, so she has been new to the job for a few months and has already jumped in. <laughs> Thank you, Heather. I get to introduce really the action steps of how we use the Title VI funding. And so as you all know, we embrace culture here in David Douglas. And so one of the things we have done, one of the many Native American Cultural Night, um, that took place November 17th and we had over 200 participants there. Um, it, was, it was jumping. Some of you may have been there as well. So thank you for your participation with that. Um, we move on to support the David Douglas Indigenous Student Union. We have students participating at lunch um, and really diving in more around Native American culture and sharing their experiences and what that looks like here in David Douglas. We have used some of that funding for materials, um, advisory extra duty pay, and field trips. Uh, moving on to Native Student Cultural Workshop Series, that was a brainchild of our own Cassie Woods and Bill. Um, and others who participated. But what that really looks like, we have um, 26 students across K through 12 participating in our cultural workshop series. Um, and it's a three school day workshop. We've had one in February, March, and headed to April 23rd. During that time, students have had an opportunity to do beading, murals, um, they're creating a mural right now, uh, weaving and traditional games. Um, we had evening and community celebrations, so we have that coming up May 17th where our students will have an opportunity to unveil the mural that they've worked on. And what's so fun about this, and hopefully it's captured in my next slide, but what's so fun about this, you have students from K through 12 just like all working together. Um, and we have one student, I think he's a junior, and he's in charge of keeping up with the, maybe a kindergartner? Yeah. Yes, who runs circles around him, but it's really nice to watch. Um, I want to invite you to watch the Native American Culture Night um, on the screen now. Here's our 2023 Cultural Night video. Hi, David Douglas. Uh, my name is Garrett Weston. I'm an enrolled member of the Confederate Tribes of Grand Ronde. And on November 13th, uh, we attended uh, the 2023 uh, Culture Night event at David Douglas High School that was attended by over uh, 200 community members, uh, families, and uh, representatives. Um, and my favorite part about uh, the event was uh, being able to uh, be with my family and community. Um, really, the event was important as far as uh, building community for uh, tribal members who live in the metro area. A lot of times, uh, we don't have the opportunity to, to gather and uh, attend uh, cultural nights like that or cultural events as many of our, our tribes uh, live in very rural areas and so when our tribal members come and move to the metro area for uh, economic opportunities you know, they often has that disconnect uh, with the culture so providing these opportunities uh, such as David Douglas is a great uh, way to um, increase equity uh, with the district.
Thanks for tuning in to our Native American Culture Night Celebration video. Events like this provide opportunities to elevate families to gather and be immersed into the rich culture shared by our Native American Indigenous community members. I'm Josh, a David Douglas parent. And I'm Travis, an eighth grade student at David Douglas. We are members of the three affiliated tribes of North Dakota, Mandan, Hadassah, and the Arikara Nation. My favorite part of this event was connecting with families, community members, and being able to talk to old friends, meet new people, and eat and hang out with them. My favorite part of the event was seeing how the event has grown. There were a lot of families and partners that showed up. I saw many of my friends and peers, and I was able to share about the canoe family and my jumps. I enjoyed the tacos and visiting all the tables. This was the third year that the Native American Parent Advisory Committee hosted the Native Culture Night at David Douglas High School. If you are interested in being part of NAPAC, please reach out to Bell Koskela, instructional coach, or Cassie Wood, the Family and Community Partnership Coordinator. We look forward to future gatherings. Thank you, Sandy. Heather, I'm sure two of those gentlemen look familiar to you. <laughs> and moving on, Sandy, you can advance to the next slide. So looking ahead, um, I just wanted to ensure, and thank you, Cassie, for helping with the slideshow. David Douglas Indigenous Student Union at the high school. Um, again, that um, those meetings take place during lunchtime, and we have a host of students involved in that um, student union. They will be going to Portland State in a few days, and also a current activity they just completed. They took a trip down to the Portland Art Museum. And here from the series that I spoke about earlier, here's some pictures. You can see our students engaging with the mural activity, making beads, and also doing some, um, they're creating drumsticks. And more of that. I'm really proud of what we do here in David Douglas. As um, Heather had mentioned earlier, we are in the multi-year grant cycle, so the NAPAC goals will continue. And again, we really want the voice of our community, our parents, and they set those goals. And as follows, um, one of the goals to increase the cultural identity and awareness, increase parent participation. We have completed and submitted part one of the application and working on the second. And currently 55 students is a new record like Heather brought up earlier. So part two of that application is due May 10th um, and we are hoping to get that completed. Thank you again for listening. Thank you. A little later in our agenda, we are going to have the public hearing on our application for Title VI funds. Um, we jumped ahead a little bit, but we will come to that um, at that time, come back to that at that time. Now we are going to proceed with our public comment and with Katie Amos. Each person does have three minutes. Thank you. Need you to turn your turn the mic on. Yeah. On? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, there you go. Counselors, stand up real quick. Yeah. <laughs> Good evening. My name is Katie Amos, and I am a school counselor at Fur Ridge Campus. First off, I love my job. I have to pinch myself that this is the work that I get to do each and every day. I love our students, and it is an honor to support them and learn from them. They are smart, resilient, creative, and determined, and they give me hope for our future. 
To top it off, I work with a team of incredibly talented, caring, and creative educators and a supportive and student-centered administrator. I feel so lucky. And as you're gonna hear tonight, this job is incredibly difficult. We are in the midst of a teen mental health crisis. This is my 10th year at Fur Ridge, and each year it feels like the level and intensity of needs increases. We are seeing more high acuity mental health struggles, such as self-harm, suicide ideation, and substance abuse. And many days I feel like I'm running triage, doing my best to prioritize the highest level needs, knowing that there's no possible way to meet all of the demands. On top of the triage of mental health concerns, I individually schedule every single student's courses throughout the year, six times, meticulously track credits towards graduation, write and manage 504 plans, create our building's master schedule, serve on our building leadership team, prepare students for post-secondary options, run our PBIS and student intervention teams, and the list goes on. Our kids are begging us for help. I know we all care deeply about our students' mental health, but we continue to be okay with massive caseloads for counselors and entirely too many extras that take school counselors away from the critical work of counseling. One of the most prolific problems in our building is substance use. Let's think about why. If you're a young person and you're struggling and your access to services is limited, what do you do? You find a way to cope as best you can. And for many, for some, that is turning to alcohol or drugs. Last year, our principal gave up FTE in one department in order to rearrange funding so that we could try to hire a substance abuse counselor. We still do not have a substance abuse counselor, though I hear there's works, it's in the works. We are trying to implement restorative practices in our district, but still suspend kids for drug and alcohol offenses instead of connecting them to vital services. I don't think our schools can solve the teen mental health crisis on our own, but I do believe we can do better. I believe student mental health is one of the primary things impacting our attendance rates and our academic performance, and I believe as a small district, we could be a leader in our state on how to address these needs. But we have to be willing to put our money, energy, and creativity where our values are. I would be happy to meet with any of you to share ideas and vision on how to do this. I truly appreciate each and every one of you and the work you do. Thank you for your time and attention. Thank you. Thank you. Alex Bain. Hello. My name is Alex Bain. I am a newly hired school counselor at Ventura Park Elementary, as well as a current graduate student at Portland State University, finishing my degree towards school counseling and a licensed professional counselor license. I have thoroughly enjoyed working as both a staff member and an intern at Ventura Park. My admin team, Lydia Smith and Mickey Johnson, show in both their words and their actions how they support both me and my role at our school. I have loved pushing into classrooms and facilitating small groups where students can engage with social and emotional content, as, such as where negative thoughts, what are negative thoughts and how do we work with them, discussions about emotional regulation, and connecting what we do with our brains, processing information, or holding affinity spaces for fourth and fifth grade girls who identify as black, African, and African American. The part of my job that's been hard, while I'm currently still in my graduate program at PSU, learning the standards of our profession per the guidelines of the American School Counselor Association, the Oregon Department of Education, and Portland State's k Crep program status, the functions of my job do not align with my current graduate education and the professional standards they're teaching us. This makes my role as a professional school counselor ineffective. The professional standards for professional school counselors include providing tier one and tier two style interventions, which include classroom lessons, short-term individual counseling, and small group experiences. A specific part of my job that is unique to David Douglas that I'm not taught or educated to do is initiating and completing evaluation paperwork for special education services. The time it takes to schedule and hold these evaluation meetings, meet and complete paperwork with parents and other specialists, and then finalize this collected information for our systems is so much that I often do not have space in my day or week to focus on those previously stated professional standards of my job. I have kids every day asking me, will you have time to talk to me today? And I often can't give them an answer. This year has been such a great challenge for me and I feel grateful, especially as someone who's still in the beginnings of my career, to have a chance to speak on this and be a part of the move to align this role with the national and state standards of our profession. And I thank you for your time. 
Thank you. Kim Anderson. Hello. My aging eyes. I'm Kim Anderson. I'm the school counselor at uh, David Douglas Online Academy, DDOA. Thank you so much for seeing our students. Thank you for seeing our staff. We really, truly appreciate it. I'm so thankful of the opportunities that you all sitting in front of us have provided for having DDOA as an option for our students. We're a unique school at DDOA, the only K-12 school, virtual school in our district. DDOA has been a phenomenal place to work. And I realize that many of our students come to us because of trauma. Trauma because they are experiencing a mental health crisis, anxiety, bullying, fear, safety, or wanting a smaller environment to learn. At DDOA, we try to build unique opportunities for our students, such as in-person study hall, elementary, middle school, and high school assemblies, you should attend one, uh, student leadership, coffee with the counselor, or hot cocoa, or you know, tea if that's what you like, craft club, fall celebration, winter celebration, field trips, and Friday fun days. We're a small staff at DDOA, the little engine that could, if I may, and we keep chugging along. We enrolled 146 middle school and high school students at the start of quarter three, so that was the high school semester break. We currently have 384 enrolled students with more enrollments coming every day. All grade levels have doubled since the beginning of the school year, and each level of education provides a different set of skills and a different set of challenges for me as a, in my role. Some of my responsibilities are communication with caregivers and students to onboard them at DDOA, evaluating transcripts and scheduling classes, post high school related work, graduation, middle school scheduling. Evaluating and scheduling at DDOA is a multiple step process. Enter in Synergy, enter in Apex, email parents, email students, email teachers. Classroom lessons for elementary student. If there is one thing the pandemic did right by me was perfecting the virtual presentation for, for school counseling lessons. Providing school count, or new student orientation middle school and high school transitions, section 504 case manager, don't worry, I'm not gonna mention Senate Bill 819, facilitation of the initial special education pre-evaluation process, student intervention team facilitator, attendance and engagement, PBIS leader, student leadership co-advisor, and those things that aren't in our job duties, like sitting with a student as they are disclosing gut-wrenching, heartbreaking things. The moments that our young people are trying to navigate through and we often sit with them in that space. In reviewing my statement last night with my husband, he told me, Kim, it sounds so upbeat. And he cautioned me in using the word failure. But in many ways, as a school counselor, I feel like I fail my students daily. The responsibilities that I have of non-school counseling duties, things that we are all responsible for, take time away, precious time, from our students and successfully being able to serve them in the way that we're educated to serve them. This job is extremely rewarding. It's incredibly heavy, and you need to know that. Thank you. Sean Orchard. Oh, God. <clears throat> well, thank you for, for allowing us to speak this evening. I, I greatly appreciate it. Uh, I've been in district 20, I don't know, 26, 27, 28 years. I don't even know. Um, so <laughs> un unlike my, my peer back there, 
um, I'm, I'm looking at the end of my career at this point, and it's been a great career. I worked uh, mostly as a school counselor in uh, at Gilbert Park, and I worked at Lincoln Park for a moment, and, and I've been at Menlo Park for a long time, and they haven't kicked me out yet. So, but in addition to that, I've had other great opportunities in this district. In addition to my, my day job, I've, I've been a member of the flight team and being a supervising counselor while working in, part, uh, in a partnership with Portland State University uh, for a few years, in, in which we had an on site uh, counseling. Um, let me go back to my notes. Uh, we had, a, on, uh, we had a, a partnership with Portland State in which we had an on site counseling clinic for our K 12 students at North Powellhurst. And for several years, I've also um, years ago, I got to be an assistant at the high school for swimming and water polo, which I also loved outside of my, my day job. I also had the opportunity to work as a TOSA vice principal at Lincoln Park for a couple of years. And following that experience, I applied for a, an admin position. And thank goodness, to, the, to give the credit of that interview committee, they told me no. <laughs> and I got put at Menlo Park, and I've been, um, again, like, like you're hearing from, from my, my peers, it's, it's been a great job. And I worked uh, with a, a number of administrators. Uh, I, I said a few, but I worked with like seven, seven different admins over the years in my role as a school counselor. And I have appreciated those relationships and had good relationships with, with each one, and I've been very supportive through my years. But for a moment, I want to shift a little bit away from that and talk about um, my master's uh, was in school counseling. My wife says it's not about you, but this is about me for the moment, so thank you. My master's was in school counseling, or not school counseling, but in counseling psychology with an emphasis in school counseling, and that was quite a, while, quite a while ago. And fun fact for me, my hiring principal actually came up to Lewis and Clark. I was taking my last class at Lewis and Clark. It was summer. My, my hiring principal, Bruce Nemus, actually came up and, and offered me a position. He sat, we sat out during one of my breaks, and he offered me a position. And ironically, that last class was an introduction to special education, and it was my only class that I had ever taken on special ed. After I started that job, my job, I got to do a lot of teaching in classrooms and, and a number of other counseling responsibilities, but in addition, I could have never imagined how much special ed paperwork would be involved in, in, in our jobs on a day-to-day -day basis. And if we had a, more time tonight, I, I would ask you to do an activity with me to close your eyes and to think about for a moment, based on what you've heard tonight and what you know about us as counselors, what do you see as the role of a true school counselor at any level? I would ask you to think about what images does that, does that evoke or what words come to mind. And I would hope for all of us, the positive ones, such as advocates and people who are present and passionate about our students and people who listen and care and respect our children and their families, we support them all and our teachers. Back to the special ed stuff. The, um, there have been many days of special ed paperwork and meetings that have filled my time and put me in direct conflict with what I imagine I should be doing more of, which is counseling, being a counselor. And instead, you know, uh, our, our elementary counseling cohort, we kind of refer to ourselves jokingly, but maybe not so jokingly, as sped, sped secretaries, because there is a lot of it in our jobs. The SPED process from the time I started as a counselor in district, we've always had that as a part of our jobs. And, and going back, I found a 1985 book in my job description of counselors in my office the other day. Um, and that's been part of our jobs for, for that long. And it's been an ongoing conversation for my time in, this, in our district here. And it's become much more complex and time consuming as, as you're hearing, I hope you're hearing. And if you spent more than five minutes in the room with me, I'll tell you that this is a misuse of our time when I talk about the things that is challenging about our jobs. We have a ton of things that are, that are great, but that's a big challenge. And I dare say there have been times that I don't feel like I've fulfilled my job as a counselor to the point of briefly thinking that my job title is incorrect. I'm not a specialist, I'm a generalist, because we do so many things that do not have anything to do with what we think we need to be doing, counseling. And in recent years, I've declined to take on some interns because I don't know that I can do right by them because I'm afraid I'm doing too much of this, the other things in, in the past. And I thought about, for a moment, I need to go back to school because I don't, I'm not doing enough of this work to be good anymore, to be good at it, to be good enough at it. But all that to say, that aside, 
I do. I am very proud of our district, and I'm proud to do the work that we do, and I'm, I'm very proud of, of my peers behind me, and I'm and extremely proud of, of the, the elementary counseling team that we have right now, and I'm proud of my Menlo team, my entire building. And I want to uh, give a shout out to my, my admin team and my, and my behavior specialist. And more than other years, they've been protecting my time as much as they can to take me off the walkie and to, to let me do the things that I need to do to try to increase some of that counseling time with, with small groups and seeing kids and doing the things like that. And they also protect my time to do the SPED paperwork, which is still far too much. Uh, oh, gosh, Mr. Long. I know you've been wondering, well, since I start talking, yes, we're still doing five-star grills. <laughs> Culture matters in our buildings, and I wish I could say more about that if I had time. But I will say, if you've never seen Mr. Long throw a, a little milk carton across the room or, or pick up a, a blue brain, put in a spoon and toss it into your mouth, he's, he's the man right there. <laughs> We've had good times. But seriously... And I'll, I'm getting close to ending. I'm, I'm hoping, I'm hopeful for the school counselor sitting behind you, in front of you, behind me. I hope one day that they will be truly and fully unleashed to lean into being school counselors, unencumbered by the special ed paperwork and, and other non-essential things that we've been asked to do. That is our desire. And I'll end with this. On my wall, among all of the other distracting stuff in my room, is a little picture um, it, with a quote, and it says, Courage doesn't always roar. Sometimes courage is the quiet voice at the end of day saying, I will try again tomorrow. And I will say, these people behind me, they show up every day with that courage, and they make things happen for our students and our families. And I thank you for your time, and I do appreciate all that you are doing, that, everything that you do as well. Thank you. Thank you. Michelle Rhodes. Hello, I'm Michelle Rhodes. I'm just a community member. I don't work here or anything. <laughs> um, I thank you for this opportunity to be able to come in and speak to you guys. Um, my kids, I live in David Douglas School District. I've been in this area for 17 years, and I'm quite fond of it. And I live close to Ventura Park Elementary. And I coach a track team that's outside of David Douglas, but um, we use the Floyd Light Middle School track for our practice. And they've been really wonderful to work with, and I want to acknowledge that. Um, there was a safety issue we had, and I just want it to be brought to your attention. Um, there were some motorized vehicles that they like to drive on the track and the nearby fields at Floyd Light Middle School. It was very terrifying because I was at track practice with my kids, who are grades third grade through eighth grade. So there are eight-year-olds and nine-year-olds out there as well as the public that comes and uses the track because it's right by the East Portland Community Center. These motorbikes were tearing around the track, around our kids, and it was terrifying. I reached out to the school, um, the district, and asked for them to help by posting signs. I've called the police and let them know but as we all know, it took a while for them to show up, <laughs> and the people were gone. They were middle school kids, actually. Um, luckily, the district has put up signs. They put them up this week, and they took immediate action, and I really appreciate that, and I wanted to say that, that there are now signs that say no motorized vehicles allowed. So I wanted to say thank you. I also want to know what to do as just a community member who's coaching a track team Besides just calling the police every time, if there's anything else I can do to make this a more safe situation for this community. And what I guess I want a little bit of assurance that um, the district will continue to focus on safety because I see these families walking the track at night that aren't part of my track team. 
And the, the thought of someone getting hurt because ATVs are on there is just a terrifying thought. And this is my voice, and I just want to be here and bring it to your awareness and also just say I appreciate what's already been done. That's it. Thank you. At later in our agenda, um, there is time for the board members to give reflections or responses on what we have heard during public comment, um, as we do not, cannot do that at this time. But we do appreciate everyone who has shared. Um, and there are no just community members. Um, your voice is equally important in this room at all times. Thank you. Um, and now we'll have a student comment. Do we have any students who wanted to share tonight? If not, then we have comment from our, I'm sorry, was there? No, okay. <laughs> if not, then we will have comment from our DDEA representative. Good evening, and thank you again for this opportunity um, to share what's happening in DDEA with you. Um, first, I would like to thank our amazing counselors for speaking tonight and telling their story about how they endlessly serve our students, our families, and our teaching staff. <laughs> I know I've gone to a counselor in my school to talk about stuff. Um, so I really, really appreciate them telling their stories tonight. Um, Hearing it from their words is very powerful. Um, a quick update on uh, things that are happening in DDEA. Next week we are having our elections for secretary, treasurer, uh, executive board at large, and building representatives. Um, so we're looking forward to seeing who those folks will be next year. Uh, we have a lot of great returners, which we're excited for. Um, next, the following weekend is the OEA Representative Assembly, and so that is essentially the annual business meeting of OEA, our state organization, um, and we will discuss and make decisions about the work at the state organization level for the coming year. Um, DDA is sending 14 delegates to represent our members. Um, it's a long weekend, but it's very well worth it. <laughs> um, before I go, I would like to share some thoughts about valuing and respecting our educators. While I wholeheartedly believe that this school board values and respects our educators and the positive working relationships that we have had here in David Douglas are something that we are very proud of, I also know that our members felt very disrespected by a comment made by a member of the district's team on Monday night. Teachers and other licensed professionals play a significant role in shaping the minds and character of future generations. They not only teach academic subjects, but also instill important life skills, values, and critical thinking abilities in our students. Respecting our educators ensures that they can effectively carry out this vital role. Teaching is a demanding profession that requires a high level of dedication, patience, and expertise. As you know, educators spend countless hours planning lessons, grading assignments, and supporting students both inside and outside of the classroom. Respecting their work and the expertise that they bring acknowledges their professionalism and commitment to their students' success. By showing respect for teachers, students learn an important lesson in respect for individuals in positions of knowledge and expertise. This sets a positive example for how they interact with others in society, both in their academic careers and their future professional lives. In summary, I believe that educators are invaluable assets to a school district, as they are instrumental in promoting student success, fostering holistic development, implementing the curriculum, managing classrooms effectively, pursuing professional growth, engaging with the community, cultivating a positive school culture, and advocating for our students' well-being and educational rights, recognizing and supporting the vital role of teachers and all of our educators is essential for building thriving and inclusive educational environments. 
Thank you. Thank you. Um, and now we will have comment from our OSEA chapter representative. If there's someone here from OSEA tonight. Okay. If not, then at this time, um, I need to declare a brief recess um, in order for to allow for public comment to the Title VI Education Funds um, presentation that we heard earlier. Okay. And Tay, did you have anything else?
Hi there, I'm Hannah Goldberg. I'm one of our uh, SLC AFS teachers at Menlo Park. And I'm Laura Chapman. I'm the language development specialist at Menlo Park. I'm getting up, sorry. Um, so we're gonna go over a couple slides about autism awareness and acceptance, and then also talk about uh, what our equity team at Menlo Park is doing. So if you've met one person with autism, you've met one person with autism is a quote that is often tied into our community. Uh, it tells us how different the autism spectrum is and how many different students show up in different ways and need different supports and also shine. Um, autism is a neurotype that impacts how people do many things, primarily falling into the buckets of executive functioning, social interaction, communication, sensory processing, and repetitive thoughts and behaviors. The latest statistics say that between one in 34 and one in 56 people are diagnosed with autism. Autism is a disability that impacts people differently. While some students may need very intensive supports to be successful at school, autistic students are part of every group of students you can think of. From our ELL students, to our TAG students, to our artists and scientists, autism doesn't limit our students. This month, I wanna highlight what does limit our students and celebrate how our district is working to lower those barriers. So this is uh, some speech samples from some of the kids in my class. Um, there's many barriers to autistic students thriving in our school systems. Our student services team has been working very hard to reduce those barriers. One that I wanna celebrate in this presentation is the work that's being done to help our students who don't speak orally to share their thoughts and desires. Since autism can impact communication, many of our students, while having rich inner dialogues, don't have the tools to share their thoughts. This both creates frustrations for the students who cannot get their specific needs met, or bring people into their world, and it creates a stigma with our other students and staff who assume because they don't communicate typically that they lack the level of sophistication of their peers. Our speech paths and AT specialists have helped get personally owned devices for three fourths of the students and dozens of the students in my class and dozens of students across the district. This allows students not just to communicate with their peers and teachers, but to improve their ability to communicate at home. It alleviates so much stress on the part of the students as they can finally get exactly what they want or need and also builds relationships with their peers as they are able to share interests, ask to join in, and participate in their academics in new ways. This is just one of the ways our districts are improving the lives of our artistic students. I wanna say that these systems all look different and we have systems that students are using where they're able to ask for exactly the specific thing that they want to the details of I had a kid ask me to sing head, shoulders, knees, and toes, but with different words in each place and he would have never been able to ask for anything like that a year ago. And so him being able to get exactly what he wants and the joy on his face when he was able to do that is such a change for him and it's really amazing. We are all aware of autism, although awareness of what autism looks like and how our autistic students and staff can best be supported is sometimes lacking. We are now working on acceptance or taking that awareness and changing how we shape our environment to make schools more successful for all students. With that shift, we will move towards inclusion or truly having environments where all students can shine. In our society, we've made a lot of growth towards inclusion for many groups, but our society is still lagging behind for people with disabilities. My hope is that our district can be a shining example of how to include all students in education that sets them up for a meaningful life. Thank you. Um, and now I'm gonna share a little bit about what our equity team has been doing at Menlo Park. And we've been working on the culturally responsive teaching practices. And so this year we focused on two different CRTs. The first one was arranging the classroom to accommodate discussion. And we practiced that during um, some professional development times with all staff so that they can feel what it's like to be in different discussion um, arrangements and yeah, and then the, we did the same thing with CRT 10, using class building and team building activities to promote peer support for academic achievement. We practice it during PDs so that teachers are able to do the activity themselves, and then it makes it easy for them to just swoop in and do that activity with their students. And another one we started last year, but that we've continued is explaining and modeling positive self-talk. There's so much negativity in our world. We really want our students to feel comfortable and confident. Like we want them to think it's okay to say positive things about themselves. So we have this bulletin board up in our school and it has little mirrors and it says 
has some positive affirmations on it so they can practice saying it to themselves. And every morning in our morning announcements um, that are announced to the whole school, we end it with a positive affirmation and it's the same for each week or all week we have one sentence and then everyone can repeat after that. So they kind of start the beginning of the school day saying something positive about themselves so everyone can start on a good foot. And the PDs that we've done this year, we've done white dominant culture um, part one and then we wanted to expand on that and go a little deeper so we did another one. And then we've done asset based language and communication and coming up in May, we have LGBTQ to SIA, and yeah, we're looking forward to that. And our last thing we've been working on is empathy interviews, and we're really excited. We really want to dig deeper and see what the students really think and feel, and so we applied and received a grant from ODE, and it's maybe we started this process in October, and we're now just next week meeting with our um, the organization that's training us, so it's been a long process, but we got the grant for it, so that was great, and so we'll start working with them soon to do empathy interviews and see what we can change for next year to make all of our students feel comfortable and supported at Menlo. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any comments? questions okay if not we will go move on to our next um, invited public comment is from the DEI department Arab American Heritage Month presenter Sabrina summer <laughs> all right good evening can you all hear me yes all right cool um, thank you for having me. Um, my name is Sabrina Summer, and I am very privileged to be one of our district equity specialists here in David Douglas. And uh, tonight I'm here to share a little bit about how we're going to be celebrating um, Arab American Heritage Month. Um, as you all know, we have a lot of students in our district that come from cultures that are not the dominant culture of the United States. We have students from all over the world, arguably. And so that is part of the reason our department exists, part of the reason we um, elevate the stories and the experiences of different people in our community, especially those that have been traditionally erased or ignored or uh, just not given the same uh, treatment in our community. So. It's really cool to see how that is changing. It's really cool to see the ways that we are elevating different voices and um, celebrating the difference that exists in our community as a gift to us. Um, so I'm gonna share some slides. These slides I did not create. They came actually from Janan Clower, Clower, one of the counselors that was here speaking just a little bit, bit ago. Double duty, right? She's doing equity work and created this amazing slideshow for um, our whole district and allowed us to share it across the district so that everyone else can benefit from the resources and the lesson plans and the various things are, that are within this slideshow. So it's very long. There's a lot of great information. and I'm just going to uh, highlight a few things. This slide talks a little bit about uh, the 22 Arab nations um, that exist, mostly in northern Africa. Uh, the interesting thing that I learned in this was that Arab Americans are not necessarily a single ethnic group, but rather are more connected to each other as a community through language, through the Arabic language. So there's a lot of diversity um, in Arabic uh, communities, which is really cool. Um, let's see, can, thank you, Sandy's on it, she's just on it. Um, across the world there are uh, over almost 500 million Arab people and here in the United States 3.7 million um, Arab Americans and fun fact I looked it up this morning because I got curious in Portland um, we are just under 10,000 uh, Arab Americans 
So, uh, it's, and it's a growing community, not just here, but across the world. It's a, a community that continues to grow. Um, let's see, so let's go to the next slide. Oh, sorry, yeah, th that shows you where, what nations are Arab nations. And we can go ahead and go to the next slide, Sandy. Actually, let's skip ahead a little bit. We're gonna go to slide, we already did slide 10. So let's go over to slide 35. I know we're skipping a lot. We have a lot of books in the slideshow for every grade level, it's pretty cool. Um, all the way from pre-K all the way to high school and beyond, um, our CTP participants can also access the resources that are here, not just the books, but in the lesson plans uh, that we will look at in just a second. And we can just go on to slide. Can, um, yes, right here. We got the lesson plans right here. There's some really cool things in here. And um, what we do is we send it out to the district. We'll do that on Monday uh, across the district and um, encourage people to use the lesson plans and to find things to pull from the slideshow that they can do in their buildings. And it is really cool to go into buildings. And you probably all have seen this before, but uh, you know there will be bulletin boards that are decorated with the current Heritage Month, and there will be lots of other activities and information available to students and families um, in our schools. So it is really cool to see how that um, just kind of reverberates throughout our community as we celebrate. And again, we do this to elevate the voices and the experiences of people who have long been marginalized in our community and to uh, empower our students so that they can feel empowered to, to their education and to their success here. Um, and I think that's all I've got for you today, unless you have any questions. Do we have any questions? No. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for your time. Thank you for sharing. Oh, sure. I, d I just want to say how uh, personally gratifying it is that we have uh, members both the autistic community and the Arab community uh, representing our district, bringing these unique perspectives to uh, everything they do and just really enhancing and um, just bringing so much beauty to our classrooms and our kids and our district in general. So I really, I wanna, I wanna just say, I really appreciate it, thank you. All right, our next pr presentation is Women First. Uh, Shannon Olive. Well, good evening, everyone. So before we get into the slides, I just want to say thank you for the opportunity for coming out tonight. Um, my name is Shannon Olive, and I am the founder and executive director for Women's First Transition and Referral Center. Um, we work to search women transitioning out of prison, women in recovery from addiction, and women recovering from other trauma, helping them to overcome their obstacles so they too can also become successful and productive women of our society. Our primary focus is black women, but we're open to serve women of color who's seeking a transformation in her life. Um, a little bit about this project or this new program that I'm gonna be sharing with you all um, just as I think Stephanie had shared about the young man who stepped up here and said um, about um, her feedback that she gave to him, um, how we came about this new program um, that I'm going to share with you all tonight is in our program that we work with our women, we um, allow our women to allow their voices to be heard. And one of the things that they shared with us um, last year is that um, with supporting families. Um, when we have our Let's Connect um, on the second Saturday of each month, we allow their voices to be heard at that Let's Connect. It's a team building activity where women get to pour in and talk about, um, you know, just concerns that they may have. We have team building activities, we eat, we play, we get to learn more about the women that we serve. And they share with us that, um, you know, some of their 
family and, um, you know, whether it's a sister, brother, niece, nephew, um, has been affected by violence. And um, they wanted to do something about it because when they leave the meetings that we have, workshops and different things, that they leave and they go home and there's violence in the family, domestic violence, there's gun violence, whatever that may look like. And there would be, they would like to have something be done about it. And so we as an organization, we're always here to, our goal is to work to rebuild women's lives to help them to become successful and productive citizens of our community. So if we're helping them, then they're going back to their families and having struggles with family members that can cause them to become, it's a struggle. So what can we do to help not only them, but their families as well? So when we looked at what we can do is this uh, new program that was funded by the Northwest Health Foundation, which is through the Justice Reinvestment Equity Program from the state of Oregon. It started back in 2019. We said, you know, let's, let's, we need to do something about it. So um, it's called Education Out of Incarceration, and it's helping young adults ages 16 through 24 um, with the same lens of um, helping our young adults um, to be able to empower women to reclaim their lives as a young age, 16 to 24. And so when we thought about what can we do with helping them um, from the same lens, um, but offering at a different um, young adult um, um, lens of helping them with their, as being a young adult. So um, I'm gonna share with you the slides that we have um, and go back to, so who we are, a nonprofit 501c3 culture Pacific organization serving women of color as myself, Shannon Olive. We're located on, um, so I just wanna say that we have our board member here, Kathy, she helped put the slide together. We're in the process of transitioning into a new building. So um, when she put located, our, that's our, we're transitioning. But currently, right now, we're on 214th and Stark and Gresham. Um, we are looking to locate to a new building. We serve women in Multnomah and also Clackamas County. Um, next slide, please. We have a clean and sober long-term recovery continuum care to end the cycle of destruction and help women to thrive. So as I see you all's um, uh, tag on your We Are Douglas, you guys is here to learn, grow, and thrive. So we got something in common, right? Um, we're housing services. We have women's empowerment groups, peer mentorship and reintegration, navigate back home, life skills development, domestic violence services, referral to support services, and a drop-in center. So some of the things that we will be providing for our young adults is helping them with all those type of services and some other services as well. So one of the things that we are, just because this is a new program that we are um, just up and going, um, just getting up and starting, just creating it in the planning stage. One of the things that we thought, because of course we are working um, with young adults, we also wanted to take the time out to hear from them. So we didn't want to just say, hey, this is what you're going to do. We wanted to take a step back and hear from them and ask them what they would like. So in our part of our assessment, um, when they come in, we have a survey um, on the back end to be able to ask them questions in that survey so that we can hear from them. Because it's not only just, like I said, it's not about our voice, it's about how we can best serve them. So in that survey, of course it is those things that we have, but it's also youth. It's young adults. So if we hear from them, we truly feel that if we heard what they would like to do and what they need, then they're going to show up. It's about our criteria and our programs about participation, engagement, and attending. And if we hear some from them and they say, okay, this is what I need, this is what I like to do, then we most definitely know that we're going to get them to engage, participate, and attend. And so not only that, we are also having a big um, Let's Talk session, May 25th, because part of the surveys that we're going to be doing, we're also going to put it out on social media to be able to get other uh, young adults to participate in that and have some food and games and different things, some of the things that they're liking to do. But it's all about meeting their needs and best serving them as well um, so that we can make sure that we get the best measure outcomes in the program versus what we want because we're adults and we're looking to serve young adults. At our drop-in center, the last thing I wanted to say is that we have a drop-in center where young adults, women can come and take a shower. They can wash their clothes. They can get a bite to eat. 
They can just hang out if they need a place. A lot of people are going through a lot of things, you know, and so we have a place where it's safe, it's welcome, it's warm, and it's just a place to get out. If you've been in a negative environment, you've been in a place where you don't, you just need to get regroup and get your thoughts together. We have that safe place that you can come and you can just go and listen to some meditating music or if you just need to talk to someone. If you don't know where you're going, if it's a direction you don't know, we have that safe place at uh, Women's First that you can come in and you can just regroup and you can just get that bike to eat and just come and hang out and just get away. Come there. We're here for you. Next slide. So the Justice Reinvestment Equity Program, young women's ages 16 and 4, education not incarceration, reduce violence and build resilience, decrease justice systems involvement, wrap around support and resources, and healing from trauma. So we are here to build self-worth and empowering young women to rebuild their lives so that they can become successful and, and productive young adults here in our community. Because we know that as women, adult women, we know we've all been through something. We have a story. Everybody comes, has a different walk of life. But we're not here to judge anybody. We're here to offer a second chance. We're here to offer some support. We're here to let them know that they do belong. Um, everybody has been through walk down a path, and some of us don't even have a home to go to. Some of the young girls are just staying at somebody's house. But we want them to know that they do have somewhere to go, and they do belong somewhere. So Women's First is here, and we're here to provide that support. Next slide. What is at stake? I really appreciate Kathy putting this together for us. Because stakes is always good for people to see. Just under half, 49% of youth under 18 are females in the U.S. 23% of Oregon students do not graduate on time. 32% of black children in the U.S. live in poverty. 11% of youth involved in Oregon Youth Authority, OYR, are females. 13% of youth involved in OYR are black. 91% of OYA youth have diagnosed mental health issues, and 95% of OYA youth have a parent that used alcohol or drugs. And one of the things that I just wanted to share is that when we looked at these states and we talked to the women in our program, a most majority of those women started crying. Because the majority of those women said that when they were young, that was them. And I can truly contest to that. That was me. So with me being a founder and the director of this organization, and I look back and say that was me, and I didn't have a program like this, nor did I have anybody to reach out and help me. And now that I have a decision to make to be able to reach out and help someone else, it's a chance that I have to be able to say, hey, I'm a privilege. I feel good to be able to say that I can take the chance and be able to look at a young woman and say, I'm here for you. And so we're really excited to be able to be a part of wanting to help the youth here at David Douglas and wanting to be able to give them that opportunity and give them that help and support. I know what I was doing when I was age 16, and it was not okay. So we're looking here to support so that these young girls can thrive, they can live their best life, and they can have an opportunity to be able to continue to rebuild their lives to become successful. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for sharing. Are there any comments or questions? Oh, could you go to the mic? Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. I'm pretty loud, though. <laughs> yeah, we have a audience. <laughs> thank you, everybody. Um, I did want to thank you, Shannon, for doing such a great job and talking about this really important program. And there's two things that I want to add. One is that in a former life, I was a drug and alcohol prevention strategist for the East County schools. Um, I taught drug and alcohol prevention at Portland Community College. I will tell you without 
any other information that this is the kind of prevention, drug and alcohol prevention programming that we need in every single neighborhood in this community. So anything you can do to encourage young women to be a part of this great organization, um, I really appreciate. The second thing is I want to appreciate all of you and thank you, um, the teachers and supporters of all of our kids who keep them safe day after day. Um, you do amazing work, and I know it's tough. It's been really tough post-COVID, um, getting us all and getting our lives back together. And again, this is one of the programs that can help our kids and our community um, heal and, and do the, all the right things that they need to be doing and, as Shannon said, live their best life. So thank you so much. I, I work in a drug and alcohol inpatient um, counseling, and, and I, I have seen over the years uh, that, that the thing that helps the most is not the classes, it's not the medication, it's not the resources. I mean, the resources really help, but the thing that helps is having a safe space where you can be around people who are on the same journey and make that connection. And I really appreciate what you've put together and what you're, what you're continuing to put together in providing the safe space, the supported environment, this connected uh, family environment. It's just, I, 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 I feel it and I, I thank you. Thank you, and we are truly appreciative that this resource is available uh, for our community. Thank you. Okay, at this time we have a proclamation. And um, this is our Arab American Heritage Month proclamation that the board will share in the reading of. And I'm going to ask uh, Board Member Stevens to begin. We're going to share, I think. Oh, yeah, yeah okay. <laughs> <laughs> so David Douglas School District Proclamation proclaiming the month-long celebration of Arab American heritage in the month of April. Whereas for more than a century, Arab Americans have been making valuable contributions to virtually every aspect of American society, including science, medicine, law, business, education, technology, government, military service and culture and whereas uh, Georgia Taya who served as the 32nd governor of the state of Oregon from 1979 to 1987 was the first Arab American elected as a governor of the United States and whereas since migrating to the United States persons of Arab descent have shared their rich culture and traditions with neighbors and friends while also set an example as model citizens and public servants and Whereas, since migrating, oh wait, no. Arab Americans brought with them the United, to the United States the resilient family values, a strong work, work ethic, dedication to education, and diversity in faith and creed that have added strength to our great democracy and. Whereas Arab Americans have enriched our society by sharing in the entrepreneurial American spirit that makes our nation free and prosperous and. Whereas the history of Arab Americans in the United States remains neglected or defaced by misconceptions, bigotry, and anti-Arab hate in the form of crimes and speech and... Whereas issues currently affecting Arab Americans such as civil rights abuses, harmful stereotyping, and bullying must be combated through education and awareness and... Whereas Arab Americans join all Americans in the desire to see a peaceful and diverse society where every individual is treated equally and feels safe and whereas the contributions of, and heritage of Ar Ar Arab Americans have helped us to build a better nation now therefore I Donna Barber chair of the David Douglas School Board of Directors do hereby proclaim April 1st through April 30th 2024 to be Arab American Heritage Month in the David Douglas School District be it further resolved that the David Douglas School Board of Directors strongly encourages our staff and community to observe, recognize, and celebrate the culture, heritage, and contributions of Arab Americans to our country, our state, our cities, and our schools. Thank you.
And I think as well want to make sure that we recognize Autism Acceptance Month as well. Although we don't have um, proclamation for it, we do want to recognize and thank the presenters for coming today. Thank you. Okay, we are still on schedule, yes. All right, our ELD adoption. Um, it, this is an action item and our ELD um, oh, presentation or pre presenter is Tay Spears and company. I want to give a shout out to Shane, who is our director of multilingual language. And Shane, in his first year, has done an amazing job in this role. And I am going to turn it over to Shane and company to elaborate around the process of the ELD adoption. There's going to be five of us presenting, so sorry, we're going to pass the mic around. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Shane Burchell. As Tay already announced, I'm the assistant administrator of multilingual programs here in David Douglas, and I'm excited tonight to be presenting. Uh, process that we went through this year. I, way back in September, I, I sat with the board and walked through that we're going to be going through this process. What I'm really excited about is not just me up here tonight presenting, but we have part of our adoption team here as well. So um, to start with, just the Oregon State adoption cycle. This is through the state. Um, there's these this certain kind of timelines and cycles of adoptions. So <clears throat> English language arts, and what's listed there is English language proficiency, which is really English language development materials. They go through on the same cycle, but we delayed that process for a year, so we chose to adopt this year, and it's been a comprehensive process this year. Um, next slide, please. And so, yeah, so this is our materials adoption process. Next slide, Sam. Um, first of all, it's about the committee, and so when we talk about English language development, one and two classes, we're talking about the English language development teachers that teach the beginner students, that's level one, and then the early intermediate students, that's like the level two students. And so we had representatives from all three middle schools and then also the high school. And then the leadership team was myself and Bel Coskill, who's not here, but Carrie Foster will be here to talk a little bit about. And she's our online uh, curriculum, K-12 curriculum coordinator. Got the title right. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, and then this is our process itself. Going kind of quickly here because I want to give these folks a chance to talk a little bit about the curriculum. Um, we had, there's been a lot of steps along the way. You can kind of see this follows a standard timeline that we have relates kind of to when we did our language arts adoption and our math adoption. But we started way back in August forming our committee. And then in September we had student surveys, empathy surveys that we interviewed, students around and collected, which was really interesting. Um, and then we had our first initial round to set our priorities for the adoption. And then we did work with our publishers and narrowing down that curriculum. In November then, we went from, we went from five curriculums down to three. And then we had presentations around those curriculums to select. And then once we selected curriculums, starting in January, we planned for a pilot session, which is where the teachers try out the materials. Um, and then in February and March, we did piloting. And we piloted two different sets of materials. In addition to the piloting also in February, we did uh, community input events where we um, hosted sessions for parents, for the family members from our English language development classes, ELD 1 and 2, with translations. Um, we also did some outreach phone calls um, from some of the other languages. Uh, so we had Spanish, Chinese, and Russian uh, interpreters in our community event sessions, but we also made phone calls to other languages like Dari in the Vietnamese and a few others as well. And that's kind of fast forwarding ahead to um, last week. So at the end of our pilot session last week, we had our teams come back together for the decision day and um, we made a decision about the curriculum, which I'll reveal at the end of this. 
And that brings us up to where we're at here. Next slide, Sandy. Okay. Very important for our team. Important to all the work we do in David Douglas is we use the equity lens when we select materials. And there's so much on this slide. I'm just going to point out a few things. Um, this is really, this, this informed our work throughout. And so this really starting with the, the decision, does this decision align with the district mission and vision? And so we'll walk through a little bit around how we selected our priorities, but ultimately our priorities for the adoption were selected, all, identifi all identified areas for growth within that program. And you can kind of, as you go around, you can kind of just see each question. There's a few key points around how that's, how that was selected, essentially. And that includes that committee itself, the work from the committee, the initial empathy surveys from our students, and then ultimately student voice in selecting the materials to make their votes around which, which were the two materials that we piloted, which ones they preferred. And again, this is within our English language development classes. So we had to also not just think about like the questions themselves, but translation and access for the students as well. So each survey was translated into multiple languages so the students could give input that way as well. But again, going back to we've, our team, we have met for four different days. Teachers were out of classrooms for four different days. And every step along the way, we would come back to this equity lens to inform our decision making. And ultimately, it's just this idea that it's not one data point, but multiple data points that informed our decision. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, and, and with me we have, so spoiler alert, we selected VISTA materials. But um, important for us to also, um, as part of our selection process, partnering with our, our, our uh, textbook company, our curriculum company, really important to develop that relationship because we want to have strong professional learning as we go throughout this process. And so um, want to have uh, Rachel Bond who's with us. She's been partnering with us through VISTA. And she's going to tell you a little bit about the VISTA materials we selected and just give you kind of that 30,000 foot view of the overview of the materials. But um, we're really excited to have her here. So Rachel. Yeah. Thank you all. Um, it's a pleasure to be here and we are just beyond thrilled to have been selected, especially since I know that Shane and Carrie and Belle and all of the um, teachers who are involved just did such a thorough job of looking at different materials um, and just to, to get the like stamp of approval with <laughs> such um, a rigorous process. Um, I'm, I'm just, just thrilled that we are gonna be partnering with your district. Um, again, I'm, I'm Rachel Bond, and I'm the rep for Vista Higher Learning, um, and I live right here in Portland. Um, even if I didn't live right here in Portland, um, we, as a publisher, Vista Higher Learning, is really dedicated to partnering with the districts um, that use our programs. So we're dedicated to making sure the teachers and everyone feels comfortable in continuing that professional development through the life of the adoption. Um, and just also wanted to note that we are a publisher that just does language learning programs, so we don't publish in any other content areas, so that's really our focus, that's our passion. Um, and that kind of brings me to the actual programs that were selected. Thank you, next slide. Not next slide, this is the right slide. Um, so the program that was selected for ELD1 in both middle school and high school is a program called Get Ready. And um, the name, the subtitle empowering newcomers i think really really just says it all this is a new program um, it was specifically designed to meet the needs of kind of those older learners middle school and high school students so it's engaging um, and beyond that it it really does um, honor respect and in, invite the students to see themselves in the programs um, kind of Harkening back to what was said earlier about um, really elevating them and making them feel like um, you know they have things to bring to the table, our assets. Um, next slide. So just to clarify, so Get Ready has a middle school version and a high school version, and so it's a rich and engaging curriculum designed for newcomer students who are beginning um, the English there. It should say sorry their English language acquisition journey. Um, I'm not gonna read through all of these bullets, but obviously introducing students to um, 
all the modes of communication and grammar, promoting social and academic language development, um, engages students with rich, motivating lit literary texts and informational texts with also connections to science, social studies, math, and other content areas. There is one unique aspect of the program is the authentic media um, that is very engaging for students that thematically is aligned to each unit. And then just the unending support for, for teachers also, because we realize um, you know, what a heavy lift it is for teachers. So it's really important to provide them with those resources um, in, uh, so that they're able to do their jobs well. Um, and you can go to the next slide, please. So for ELD2, um, Bridges was chosen. Um, and Bridges is a, a, th a three-level program. Um, if you could go to the next slide. Um, it has a, a lot of similarities in terms of the online resources. Our digital platform is very robust. And as we are just a, a language-only publisher, um, our digital platforms are really focused on um, helping students to learn language with, you know, up-to-date tools. Um, bridges to literature and content designed to help multilingual students and striving readers achieve grade level proficiency, proficiency through carefully scaffolded supports and highly engaging activities. Um, a lot of these things repeat from the last slide, so I don't want to be redundant, um, but obviously just continuing students on their journey um, with the, you know, the language skills, the literacy skills, and also the connections to other content areas. Um, and I think that's it. Thank you so much. Thanks, Rachel. Now we're going to hear from our teachers. So let's start with Lori Meyer from Floyd Light Middle School. And Lori, do we have the? Do we have you tell them how many years you've been teaching ELD and David Douglas? Tw uh, 28. 20, 28 years in the district. Original. And coming to, to present tonight. Okay, I'll have to agree with um, our representative here that it was definitely engaging for my students in addition to what I'm also going to talk about. Um, I like that the, as a teacher, the um, assessments were informative. Tells me what do my students need to work on? Um, what have they learned and what do they need to work on? Um, each of the unit has a connection to several content areas and uh, my students really enjoyed those activities. Um, they had culminating activities that tapped into multi, uh, multiple intelligences. Um, some students, you know, they could do drama, they could um, write um, a song, they could write a play, and um, my students really enjoyed those activities. And this is Alex Sierra, a teacher at the high school in ELD 1 and 2. Good evening. Um, as, stated, as stated, my name is Alex Sierra. Uh, this is my 23rd year as an educator. Uh, my third year here at the high school, at David Douglas High School. It's my second year as a teacher for our fantastic multilingual students. I'm here to speak on behalf of my fellow levels one and two English language development teachers, as all of us have been very active members of the LD Adoption Committee. It's our responsibility to our students, families, and community to not only help students to meet and hopefully exceed the 10 Oregon language proficiency standards in the four domains of listening, speaking, reading, and writing. We accomplish this in part by providing all educational, all educational tools and resources as well as strategies that our students do need in order to be successful in acquiring retaining, and using the English language. It is our firm belief that VISTA's Get Ready and a part of the Get Ready system is also the Get Reading system, which I love. Uh, I, I teach the reading section for our level one students. And for the uh, level, uh, VISTA's Bridges, I believe it's C, Bridges C for the students in the level two, that they provide us with the best tools and resources for meeting our responsibilities. I provided uh, three very brief bullet points in our slides presentation, but one additional factor we teachers considered in supporting VISTA's products was that its resources were truly created 
for English language development. Um, in other words, uh, uh, in, in other words, for uh, multilingual students, they are not only resources. Let me rephrase that. Uh, they were resources were fully created for our Eng for the English language department. In other words, they were created for our multilingual students. They weren't just resources that were primarily English language arts with a modest or moderate adjustment to try and make it useful for ELD. And that made a big difference for us as teachers. Based on everything we did during our curriculum adoption process, as is being explained to you tonight, uh, we, the teachers at the high school, respectfully request that you approve the adoption of the VISTA products for our high school multilingual students who are in levels one and two. Um, if I can take a point of privilege uh, to also say, before moving to Oregon five years ago, I taught at Sabino High School in the Tucson Unified School District in Tucson, Arizona. I participated in two curriculum adoption processes there over the years. I want you to know that the process that we participated in that was led by Shane, Bell, Carrie, with the assistance of our assistant superintendent, Tay Spears, and the director of curriculum, Brooke O'Neill, as well as various individuals from their offices, this was by far the best adoption process I have ever been involved in. So simply stated, it was truly fantastic. Finally, when I left my high school in Tucson in 2019 and moved to this beautiful state of Oregon, and I learned quickly that those aren't beaches, those are called the coast here. <laughs> I thought I would never find another wonderful school community uh, like I had in Tucson, Arizona. Well, I was wrong. The administrators, the teachers, the staff, the students, and the families in our David Douglas High School community are loving and caring. I'm blessed to be a part of this community, and I consider it an honor and a privilege to be here. I thank you for that opportunity. I look forward to continuing my own educational journey as a teacher for our fantastic multilingual students for as long as I can. Thank you for listening. Good evening, I'm Carrie Foster. I'm the K-12 curriculum coordinator and I help lead the core curriculum adoptions. And as part of all of our adoption, students are the center um, of our work. And so gathering student voice is an integral and very important part of our process. And as Shane mentioned in the fall, um, we gathered um, student survey data about what supports um, students need in their instructional materials. And we also conducted um, over 50 empathy interviews with um, our ELD 1 and 2 students. Um, to learn more about what supports um, they specifically would like to see in instructional materials. And that helped inform our um, adoption, our ELD adoption priorities, which these are our priorities um, that we looked at, all the curriculums that we looked at were through the lens of these priorities built upon um, what students had said. Go to the next slide. And so I'm not going to read through all of these, but our, um, when we review um, each of the curriculums, our um, teachers um, look, they, they review the curriculum through the lens of the six priorities, as well as the instructional design of the program as a whole, and uh, teacher usability and student engagement. And these were some of the things that they highlighted that they really loved about the VISTA products. Um, and like Alex had mentioned, um, they could tell it was clearly a curriculum written for um, English language development. It wasn't just an ELA curriculum um, that was slapped or that was turned into an ELD curriculum. And that did really stand out to all of our teachers. And Rachel um, had mentioned that as well, that VISTA does specialize in English language development materials. And so that was a huge um, 
that really elevated Vista above the rest. And I'm not going to read through all of these, but um, I did also want to highlight that um, one thing that the teachers had really mentioned was the digital platform had many opportunities for students to practice in all four domains, which is reading, writing, listening, and speaking, which was huge because we know that extra practice is really important. So that was another thing that they highlighted. Um, so I'm not going to read through all of those, but just a lot of positives that came out um, of the Vista project uh, products from teachers. So I'm going to turn over to Shane to show what students said about Vista. Okay, boy, this ended up a little smaller than we would. So I go ahead and send you the next slide. Uh, back one, sorry. There you go. Okay, so um, yeah, it's a little smaller than okay, but you have it in front of you as well. Um, so these are the, this, if you can, you can kind of see here, we ask these questions, these go back to the priorities to make sure that, so for teachers modeling and doing that pilot lessons, along with we discuss these questions in our community input events, um, you'll notice on there we even have, so usually when you see like a Google survey, it's just like in English, but what we did is we went through and translated it into our top five languages so a student would have access to that material. And this is, the re this is their reactions to, to these key questions. So again, you'll see that blue yes responses, different ways to learn and practice English. The lessons are interesting. The lessons had good videos, computer activities. The lessons had many different ways for those. All of those responses from students were really good indicators of, again, we're not just saying it's only student voice, but we're going to elevate student voice along with our teachers and along with our community. And so we just wanted to highlight this from our students, that they're really excited about this product to help them with their English learning as well, their English language development classes. So that's just one piece of data there, along with you have the board packet that has the survey data from teachers along with that other, the more calibrated version of the student data as well, between the top two sets of materials we piloted from ultimately to inform our final decision last Thursday. So that's that. And then go ahead and advance one more. Sandy, thanks. Um, so and we this is and this is where you all come in. Um, so the funding, the purchase itself is so we, we're gonna be we're asking for permission approval to purchase at the middle school level, the purchase is not to exceed 125000 dollars and at the high school level the same thing and this is for materials for the ELD1 and the ELD2 classes at the middle school and the high school um, and go ahead and advance to the next slide so we did want to allow time for questions so first of all just thank you and um, we do we have recognition cards of gratitude for you all as board members that value high quality adoption so we'll make sure we get those out but did you all have any questions for us Sorry, uh, just one question. In the student um, survey, I didn't see Somali, and I know that's one of our top five, so I was just wondering if you did get Somali. Um, yeah, we ended up having to, with the surveys, so we had those there, but then we also ended up having to um, do some, like, kind of Google Translate stuff, like, via, like, phones and whatnot for surveys. Okay. Yeah. But you did, you did try, so... <laughs> Just, I was just noticing. Yeah, and we did some outreach, some phone calls and outreach in Somali as well, but we couldn't, we didn't get as many answers, okay. but yeah. Other questions? I just want to say as someone who went through ESL education when I was in elementary school, I appreciate the work you're doing with reaching out to the kids and seeing um, what they think about the curriculum as well. Thanks. Mm -hmm. And you can, and again, I, no. I just the, the passion from the teachers about this product too, and they're representing the other part of the committee, and really excited to use it and start learning about it too. And I think it's really, I'm like, I can't see the, the color, so I was like, is it on? Um, but it's really exciting too to know that the curriculum that you all have chosen is specifically for ELD. That's a huge thing because I think a lot of times we try to, you know, put a square in a circle, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and it's not going to work because kids, especially like when you're first learning or even, you know, older students who are arriving who are having to learn English older, that is a huge thing that's very difficult to do. Um, and so having something that's specialized that has them in mind is so important. So I just want to thank the 
the adoption team for really having that front and center and doing all the work that you're doing um, to involve our students and you all in our community. It's really, really cool. Other thoughts, questions? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm just always so impressed when we have a curriculum adoption and just the massive amount of work that you've all put into it, all of the minds and uh, input that it's gone into this process, and it just is really gratifying to know that our kids are going to get the best possible education because of the work you've put in. And I'm sure a lot of it's not on school time, and I want to recognize that too, that, that you're going above and beyond to make this happen. And I, I just... I, just want to say how impressed and gratified I am to hear about this. Yeah, thanks. And and really full um, gratitudes to the adoptions that came before us. So the language arts adoption, the math adoption, Carrie being working with those, she's just so instrumental in the facilitation with that same equity lens we carry from other adoptions. And that was just like a really in-depth process for us this year. So thank you. Okay. Question. Um, at the high school level, so I remember, I'm, I'm a little curious about the selection choice because we're using HMH at the high school level for general EL, ELA, correct? Odell. Uh, Odell, open up. Okay. Because I'm just thinking about the continuity for, you know, ELA to ELD. So my experience with uh, the high school, like especially the upper levels of ELD, the four and five, is that there's a lot, it's almost like a support class for ELA, and so I'm just curious about the uh, transition from curriculums. Yeah, so the um, so the bridge, so the the get ready vista is like that introductory kind of level, and then the two is really written as kind of a bridge between the ELD and the LA. So you're going to see a whole lot more sort of. A, a, trying to describe this the best I can. So it's, it's gonna be a little bit more closer to that next approaching level for it to then get into the Odell open up. So students that are in like ELD three and four that are still like active English learners, they're in, they're using Odell open up, but it's in like a, what we call an English language development language arts class. And so they have the teacher in that group has got like specific background and training of how to scaffold the materials for the Odell open up. So it's a little bit of a bridge. They don't go from like one to two to mainstream. They actually go from one to two, then this ELD language arts class with using the Odell open up materials. So I think I misunderstood. So this is specific to one and two. This is one and two. Okay, okay yeah. thank you. Sorry for that. Anything else? All right, then I wanted to say thank you uh, for all that you shared tonight and for the work that you've done. Um, and I wanna thank you and Brooke, um, especially in how we are attempting to normalize a higher standard of excellence in our district. Um, that this process should be getting easier, but this that we want to stay pushing those boundaries because we want the very highest level of education for our students. And thank you for your part in making that possible. So at this time, then we, this is an action item. This is the recommendation from our educators to our board. And we need a motion um, towards adoption. I would be honored to move approval of the ELD recommendation. Is there a second? A second. It has been properly moved and seconded to adopt the ELD recommendation. Are there any questions? Then we are prepared to vote. I'm going to start with Board Member Franklin. Franklin, but aye. Commander Jordan, aye. Barbara, aye. Salatnia Lopez, aye. Wynn, aye. Barrow, aye. Stevens, aye. It is so ordered. Thank you. Thank you. We're moving on to our library and book challenge procedures conversation. And this is Ms. O'Neill. Thank you. And I'm going to have Jen DeFrancis come up and join. Um, so April is also National Library Month, and we celebrate our libraries. And so we're here to talk about twofold. We're here to celebrate our libraries, but we're also here to talk about a very serious 
um, subject that has an increasing trend across our nation, which is uh, book challenges and what our district protocol is in responding to challenges, uh, should we get one. So, uh, but before we get started, I do just want to sing the praises of our school library program um, research consistently consistently highlights the positive impacts that libraries have on student achievement and just to, to name a few including but not limited um, just to say improved academic achievement promotion of literacy equity and inclusivity I hope Jen talks tonight about has just done a fantastic job of um, choosing books and selecting books that diversify our collection representing the students that we serve and it's really so beautiful to see also we know that our libraries are safe and supportive um, spaces for our students if you have not been in the high school library um, it is just a place you want to be that you want to hang out and I know I've visited Jen many times and there is it's just like a magnet for students so it's so um, incredible to see so we have 1.5 um, licensed librarians in our district Jen is our full-time librarian and then we have Margie Menzia who is a half-time uh, Margie supports our elementary library media assistants and she's not here today and then Jen supports our middle school library media assistants uh, for Ridge and she also runs the high school is all she does <laughs> so um, definitely a lot we also know that library media programs are part of Division 22 uh, which has to do with our collections our staffing our facilities so they're very important parts of our uh, community and we just sing their praises and the people who run them and so want to thank and highlight um, everybody who works in our librarians uh, and then I'm going to turn it over to Jen who's going to, has been worked tirelessly really on our policy around what do we do if we get a book challenge and what does that look like in David Douglas Thank you. Thank you for your time. And Brooke, as always, thank you for your support of the library program. Um, before I begin the presentation, I would like to take a couple minutes for show and tell because it is April is National School Library Month. And in fact, this is National School Library Week in National School Library Month. So how auspicious. Um, our libraries are the heart of our schools. They're safe and welcoming places where connections are made. Um, I have a different presentation than you. Mm, we'll just go with it. <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> um, we, yeah, I'm not sure how to work that out, but we'll make it work. Uh, we, that's the one. Uh, here's a typical day in an elementary school library. This is at Gilbert Park, and the students are enjoying their independent reading time, group story time, working on learning activities. And if you see that display that goes clear down the hall, it's a book-related art project that probably every kid, you can't even see it, turns the corner and the entire school participated in. Uh, here you see the students at Alice Ott enjoying their new reading nook that the LMA over there got from a DDEF grant. The, um, both Alice Ott and Ron Russell Middle Schools participate in the Oregon Battle of the Books. And in fact, last year the regional battle was held at Ron Russell. Uh, funding for the books is provided through son and parent groups and the library media assistants run a sun program for the people that would like to participate. These are some great displays at Floyd Light. All of our library media assistants um, are experts at creating uh, book displays that highlight cultural celebrations, promote new titles, and represent our diverse student body. Um, last spring, we had author Cynthia Leidick Smith visit our high school library um, in collaboration with Multnomah County Library and several of our ELA classes attended. Next. Um, aside from all the great books, uh, students at the high school enjoy using the makerspace and the art cart to create during lunch. We also have 
six chess boards that people just race in to get a, a board <laughs> before other people and other games and activities that they participate in. Uh, all the schools have activities for the students. It's a great space. Um, our high school library is a manifestation of our David Douglas motto, a place where connections are made. Um, these photos are what the library looks like any day at lunchtime and before school. Uh, these students come because they want to come. They feel safe and they feel seen. It's full of activity. It's not quiet. There's a section in the back where students can read or catch up on homework, but this is not the main reason that they come. To add on to Dr. Rudine Sims Bishop idea that books are mirrors, windows, and sliding glass doors, that every student needs the opportunity to see themselves reflected in material they are exposed to and have access to materials featuring people, backgrounds, and identities different from their own. Illustrator Grant Snyder proposes that books are so much more than that. They are springboards and stepping stones to new ideas, people, and places. They are escape hatches, quiet corners, anchors, and overcoats to protect us during difficult times. They are flying carpets to far distant lands in the past and the future. But maybe most importantly, books are beacons to students as they develop a lifelong love of reading and learning. Now, a couple years ago, I went to Brooke. I was like, Brooke, we gotta do something about this. <laughs> and so we've been working on this for a while. I wanna share our updated protocols for book selection and reconsideration procedures of challenged titles. They were developed in keeping with the American Library Association, the Oregon Association of School Libraries, and the Oregon Library Association's Intellectual Freedom Clearinghouse. Having a written protocol ensures that our library materials reflect both our library program and David Douglas' mission and guiding principles that provides a framework for consistent selection using a standard criteria. It ensures diversity of viewpoints, provides standards for collection maintenance and guidance for gifts and donations. It affirms the importance of intellectual freedom. Having a comprehensive selection protocol also establishes a process by which people can share their concerns about library materials. The same protocols apply for Sora, uh, Thank you, Sabrina, for that slide on her Arab American um, books on how to use Sora. It's free for all of our kids, e-books e and audiobooks. And so far this school year alone, over 9,200 titles have been checked out. Thank you, next. A paper published by the Oregon Intellectual Freedom Clearinghouse states the antiquated Norse word for librarian translates to book dragon, a name that highlights the necessity to guard books as treasure. Fast forward to 2024 and the need to protect library books has grown to astonishing proportions. The drive to censor materials, ban books, and criminalize librarians is at an all-time high. Although 70% of Americans polled strongly oppose banning books, the challenges made to both public and school libraries continues to increase. This report from the Washington Post shows that 60% of the challenges were made by only 11 people. Yeah. Uh, fortunately, though, um, Numerous measures have been made recently and been proposed and installed in order to safeguard library holdings and defend librarianship. This word web highlights the fact that BIPOC and LGBTQ plus authors and works are the most common targets in this recent increase of challenges. With the slogan, Books Unite Us, the Oregon Department of Education, the State Library of Oregon, and the American Library Association strongly suggest that Oregon school districts have library materials reconsideration procedure that is different from the general complaint process. Many of our neighboring districts also now have a separate policy for their library materials. Why protect books? It's the law. I'm proud to be the district librarian in a district that celebrates the diversity of our students 
and understands the importance of making connections as a means to empower learning. Not only was HB 203, 2023 passed by the state legislator to ensure textbooks and other instructional materials adequately address the roles in and contributions to economic, political, and social development of Oregon and the United States by certain classifications of individuals, including individuals who are Native American, are of African, Asian, Pacific Island, Chicano, Latino, or Middle Eastern descent, are women, have disabilities, are immigrants or refugees, or are lesbian, gay, bisexual, or transgender. By providing diverse titles like these in our libraries, it aligns with our David Douglas School District mission, our Every Student Belongs Board policy, our David Douglas equity statements and commitments, as well as several culturally responsive teaching practices. Our library program mission mirrors David Douglas' mission and everybody belongs policy. It also highlights the principles of intellectual freedom and access to information as prerequisites to the effective and responsible citizenship in a democracy. It's important to make the distinction that while library materials may supplement the curriculum, they are selected voluntarily. They are not required curriculum. Our protocols support the curriculum as well as the student's personal interests in learning. These protocols ensure a diversity of viewpoints on all topics, including controversial topics, which are defined as issues that generate strong emotions, often related to personal values and ideals. Providing materials on opposing viewpoints or controversial issues enables students to develop the necessary critical thinking skills to become discriminating users of information, responsible digital citizens, and productive members of society. Um, you can go to the next slide. You can go to the next slide. This is a summary of um, the reconsideration process provided by ALA. Uh, just briefly, it starts with having a solid, consistent selection policy. Um, an informal challenge is basically a discussion wherein the complainant expresses the reasons for concerns about a title, and the administrator or district librarian explains the selection policy and the principles of intellectual freedom. And if that's not resolved, a formal complaint process begins with a form for the complainant to submit. A reconsideration committee is formed and they read the book and meet to vote one of the three choices that may be decided are to keep the book, to remove the book, or to restrict access to a different collection. So maybe not in an elementary school, but in a middle school. Uh, to clarify the terms, a concern is when an individual who is a David Douglas staff person, parent, caregiver, or student is worried about materials that are available in the library. Uh, a complaint is the complainant discusses their concern with the teacher, administrator, or library staff, but has not formally challenged materials. And the challenge is when the complainant escalates the complaint and asks for a specific action, such as removal of the book for all students. This should always have a formal process. So um, we at David Douglas are committed to resolve all complaints in a fair, transparent, and timely manner. And we agree that caregivers have the right to guide the reading, viewing, and listening of their children, but must give the same right to others. During the reconsideration, the principles of the freedom to read, to listen, and view are protected and an item under consideration will be considered in its entirety, and the titles will remain available in the collection during the entire reconsideration process. So to break it down a little more, the informal concern is a discussion where the principal makes notes of the concerns and or objections, as well as asks, how can we make sure your family's needs are met for your child regarding reading choice materials. Caregivers can request that their students not read certain topics or titles and notes can be made in their library 
records so we can make every attempt to make sure that the caregiver's wishes are respected. And if this is not resolved, the complainant must file a formal request for reconsideration form. Uh, this formal procedure ensures that David Douglas will follow a rigorous process as outlined to give the matter all due seriousness. The superintendent and director of curriculum and instruction are informed. A reconsideration review committee is created, provided information about our selection protocols, intellectual freedom and the library bill of rights, publisher and professional journal reviews of the title and allotted time to read the material in its entirety. The review committee then meets, discusses the material, and a decision is reached by majority vote. The decision is final and is submitted to the superintendent. The director of curriculum and instruction will inform the complainant of the review committee's decision. <laughs> Brooke's like, what? <laughs> um, and all challenges, informal or formal, are reported to the state of Oregon's Intellectual Freedom Clearinghouse by the district librarian. And Jen, can you speak to who's on that? Um, Reconsideration Committee. I can. Um, it consists of an administrator, the director of curriculum and instruction, usually the principal of that school where the challenge is created, two representative classroom teachers, two community members who shall be appointed by the board, and a district librarian. And if the challenge is at a secondary school level, a student may also participate. Are there any questions? Thank you. <laughs> I was at Ventura Park Elementary for a, a get together about a month ago. And I have a friend that I used to see uh, at the park, you know, we go get lunch together, her kids and our kids. And so I popped into the library to say hi to her. She's running the Ventura Park Library now. And uh, it was a, like we kept getting interrupted over and over again by kids coming in to pick out books, to return books, to give her a hug, to hang out in a safe spot before school. It was really cool. I didn't, I didn't realize how much of a cornerstone of Ventura their library is, you know, and how much their librarian does to create that safe space and that, you know, supportive environment. So yeah. thank you for bringing that, this perspective to us. Thank you. Thank you. Others? So there has never, there hasn't been a challenge in the, our district before? There has not yet. There was an informal challenge last year, but it was informal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I had, at the very beginning when I first started um, in this position, so it was it was maybe 14 years ago, um, it, there was a book challenge, but it was in an AP class, an AP English class, and we did go through the actual formal process of having a committee come together, read the book, and make the rec a recommendation. So, but we haven't had any library challenges except for the informal concern that was brought to our attention last year. Thank you for your time. I just have one question. Are you or are the librarians involved in sort of the, we've seen so many cultural heritage presentations and different months, you know, are, are you involved in some of those slideshows and the um, curriculum that, or not curriculum, but the supplementary materials that are, yeah, if you know, like in the equity the, committees are doing? The, back end of the Arab American, right. there was like how to get onto Sora. All those books are links where you, anybody with a David Douglas email mm -hmm. can read those books for free. And I keep um, carousels of whatever heritage month it is or mm -hmm. whatever celebration, I refresh it every month. Yeah. Thank you for your work on that. It's been wonderful to see them cycle through our slideshows every yeah. month. I'm proud of it. <laughs> I had a, a few questions. I wanted to make sure I heard this right. Did you say that there was just 1.5 librarians for the entire district? Correct, correct. That are licensed um, librarians that have been through a, a library um, certification program. Mm -hmm. yes. The elementary and middle schools are run by library media assistants. 
Okay. And classified folk. Elementary and middle schools. And so then you were located in the high school? I Yes. Okay. Um, is that typical, <laughs> I guess, for a district our size? Or? I don't know if there's any typical anymore. Uh, mm -hmm. We used to have certified librarians in all of our schools. Um, and then I don't know how many uh, years ago it was that we transitioned to this current model. Um, mm -hmm. And I believe it was a result of budget mm -hmm. and how that works. And so, um, you know, we have... Um, worked really hard to support our library media assistance. And I know Jen and Margie both um, work very hard to do that. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, you know, nothing truly, you know, going through the whole program. And, and even we have um, two people at our district office that help with cataloging. Um, and they learn a lot from Margie and Jen. They're, they're stretched pretty thin, I will yeah. say. <laughs> yes. Okay. Um. The, when there is a challenge, does that, and, and I'm thinking mostly about our students, if they were making a challenge, does that have to be presented in writing, or is that just as simple as going and saying, I want to challenge this? <laughs> it starts in an informal way, like they would say, I want to challenge this, mm -hmm. and then they would, um, you know, just talk about what their objections were with mm -hmm. the principal or one of the district librarians, and if that doesn't resolve well for them then mm -hmm. they could say i would like to do a formal challenge and it starts with that form okay and so then that's where everybody kicks in and goes through the formal step by step okay mm -hmm. are the um students and parents of our district informed of the process in any formal way each year no not currently um, not currently. So we, um, you know, it's, it's always how do we make that really transparent, um, you know, for families and also, um, you know, we don't want to limit students and what they can read as well. But this is a brand new protocol for us. So we haven't shared it with anybody widely except for you guys right now. And so then we can figure out how to um, you know, have our, make sure administrators know what that is and what that looks like and then what's the best way to share if there is a concern. Okay, so for the upcoming school year, there'll probably be some way yes, of sharing yes. that information. Even from, you know, after, not even, we don't even wait for the upcoming year. We can do something now. Okay. Yeah. Great. And um, my last question is, on the reconsideration committee, um, I don't think I heard the mention of parents. Is that, is there a reason for that? You mentioned the different people who would be included on that and the I think identity. the two people selected by the board could very well be parents would most likely be parents oh, okay. yeah okay yeah all right thank you thank you there's nothing else all right okay. well that made me think of a question so is the um committee formed every time there's a challenge Okay. Yes. Thanks. Because they would be in different schools and affecting different grade levels. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you very much. I appreciate Thank you. It. Happy Library Month. <laughs> <laughs> you. Okay. Um, and now we are going to move full steam ahead to our data report on Youth Truth and being presented by a wonderful Miss Ida. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Ida Juarez Valerio, Director of Communications, Family Engagement, and Strategic Partnerships. Um, setting my timer here. Mm -hmm. It is a pleasure to be able to talk to you tonight about you truth. Um, some of what I'm going to share, it's going to be fun, but it's also going to be difficult. It's part of um, survey feedback. And like Mr. Andy Long will say, this data is truly a gift. Um, and we are very fortunate that we have it uh, so we can make the improvements necessary. Um, because the perception of our students and our families uh, matter greatly to all of us. Um, 
So we will start with some overview of the survey, um, although I know some of you already are familiar with Utruth. And then I will show you a glimpse of the data and what Utruth offers. And um, I know I only have a limited amount of time, so I'll do my best to try to cover as much as I can tonight. So briefly, this is our agenda. Can you go to the next slide, Sam? Thank you. But I want to start with some statistics. So this year, we had 7,140 responses from multiple stakeholders. Uh, that is students and families. Uh, students have the opportunity to take the survey starting in third grade. And the timeline shows you the number of responses from previous years. As you can see, if we compare the 2022 uh, number to this year, we did, have, uh, we did have an increase. Can you go to the next one? Thank you. Um, I apologize for that um, mark down there. I didn't know how to remove the 14 points percent blocking high school. Uh, but this slide shows you the percentage of families that responded to the survey. Elementary level, 40 percent. Middle school, 14. And high school, 13 percent. Can we go to the next slide? Thank you, Sandy. Same for this. I apologize. Um, this slide shows you the percentage of students that responded to the survey. At the elementary level, we had 93 percent. Middle school, 91. And our high school, 77 percent. Thank you, Sandy. Uh, the next three slides are quotes that I took from the U-Truth reports. Um, thank you, Sandy. Here you'll see three different Mill Park parents. Um, I know the font is a little small, um, but the second quote is in Spanish, but I wrote the translation in English below. Can we go to the next slide? Here you, we have um, quotes from three different Alice Hot students. And here we have three different David Douglas High School students. So why do we spend time on, on this? Next, thank you. Well, in our school district, we want to look at our systems and, um, and push ourselves to be better, to continue improving. Um, it also gives us an opportunity to hear directly from our students and our families, our key stakeholders, and, and it and we can make informed decisions. And in order to make informed decisions, it requires us to have um, diverse perspectives from, again, the key stakeholders. Can we go to the next slide? Thank you. So what is U-Truth? U-Truth is a national nonprofit organization. And every year for the last couple of years, um, so they do, they open a survey window for both families and students. And in our school district, we open the survey window during the fall semester. The surveys include age and reading level appropriate questions. And what you see here uh, for the family topics, those are some of the topics or the, some of the key measures that you see on, on the survey, just to name a few. Next slide, thank you. So how long, you might be wondering, how long have we been using U-Truth or how? <coughs> um, can we go to the next slide? Thank you. So we started partnering with U-Truth since the school year, since 2018-2019 school year. And what you're seeing here are key measures at our secondary schools. Um, we have for both um, high school for rich and middle and our middle schools we have engagement, academic rigor, relationships, belonging, and peer collaboration, culture. The the only difference you'll see is uh, college and career readiness is not part of the middle school, but it is part of the high school and for rich. Can we go to the next slide? Thank you, Sandy. At the elementary level, like I said, uh, students start taking um, the survey when they're in third grade. 
and um, they have engagement, academic rigor, relationships, et cetera. Thank you. Here's a, a sample of the questions, and I'm, I won't go through all of this because, but I want you to become familiar to the questions. Um, some of the questions, so the questions, the way your students are answering, it's, they're always on a scale. For our secondary level students, this goes one to five. Five uh, means strongly, strongly agree, four is agree. At the elementary level, the scale is one, two, three. Uh, three, is, um, three is yes or very often, okay? Can we go to the, thank you. And here's a sample of uh, the, family question, the family questions on the survey. Okay, can we go to the next one? Thank you. Um, so I'm going to show you a glimpse of what our data looks like for our individual schools. Like I said, due to the uh, limited time, it's, this is just a glimpse. So here, you have our high school student survey. And this is an example of what uh, student data that a school would use um, when they open their, um, their U-Truth reports. So here, on your left, and I apologize, the writing, uh, the image is very small. But on the right, sorry, on, on your left, you'll have, you have the key measures or themes, engagement, academic uh, challenge, culture, etc. Then you have the average. Um, the average, and that's the average rating for the questions under the category, under each category. So for example, engagement, the average rating was 3.41. And that's just within David Douglas High School. <coughs> then you'll see um, the percentile um, rank. So the number in black is the average rating percentile nationally which puts our school at the 34th percentile nationally for the very first um, key measure, which is engagement, and so on. Now, underneath, you'll see the gray line or beige uh, line, and that is um, all of the Oregon school, uh, school districts that are particip or schools that are participating in U Truth. The left mark represent the low the lowest scores. The right um, the highest uh, score, and then the middle line is the median. As you can see here, belonging and peer collaboration and engagement were the highest rated themes from the latest results, and the lowest rated themes were relationships and academic challenge. Now, here in this image, <coughs> I apologize, on, on the right, you'll see the trend data, and each dot represents a, a year. Okay, can we go to the next slide? Thank you, Sandy. Now here, um, this is another image, and this is an example of how we can drill down our subgroup data. So this is a family survey from an elementary school. And I filtered the data, oh, thank you, Cassie. Filtered the data um, to a school from a black African-American families only because um, within within U Truth, we have multiple. You can filter data through multiple subgroups. This is just one one elementary school, and just to show you an, a sample. But uh, the subgroups are some of them because there are several. Um, I can filter by by language spoken at home, gender identity, level level of education, just to name a few. But race and ethnicity is one. Mm -hmm. um, and the reality is that there is a lot of data. There is a lot of data, and, and it's, it's great, it's awesome, but sometimes it, it can be overwhelming, and it does, it does take time to digest. Yeah. Thank you, Sandy. Uh, very quickly, because I do want to share some of examples. Um, okay, but general themes, and looking at our 2023 data from a very high level, I'm going to go over some themes that stood out this year. At the elementary level, Non-binary students are rating lower than girls and boys in all themes. For families, um, we notice a consistent increase in six out of the seven themes, which is great, except for safety. 
um, English speaking families are rating lower than non English speaking families. Can we go to the next slide? Thank you, Sandy. At the middle school level, we notice that our ELL students, ELL, English language learner, are rating higher than non ELL students. Um, the other thing we, we uh, notice with the students in SPED, special education classes, are rating notably higher than students in general F, general education in all themes. For our families, uh, our Hispanic, Latino, Latinx, Latina families, they're rating higher than, any, than other races and ethnicities. Um, and f white families are, rate, are rated notably highest, uh, higher in relationships. Can we go to the next one? Thank you. For high school and Fur Ridge um, students, we did notice a slight improvement in emotion and mental health. Again, our students in SPED are rating notably higher than students in general ed. And for our families, the results um, stayed about the same. We did see some improvement in diversity, equity, and inclusion. Can we go to the next slide? Thank you. Okay, so now we're, we want to close the, the feedback loop, right? Um, so I'm gonna, so this is a, the communication plan. Uh, our administrators have seen this document multiple times already. Um, and the document is supposed to help us stay focused and, and keep us on track. The highlighted portion is where we are right now. Tomorrow, um, our schools will be sending um, you true thank you letters to families and detailing some, some key information uh, from the results. Can we go? Thank you. Here, you have a school poster. In this, in this case, this is Cherry Park Elementary School. The, post, the posters show the positives, but it also s shows the areas of improvement. And we want to make sure that we are transparent um, because we want to improve. We want to improve, we want to get better. Next slide. So every school has a poster. Okay. Here, um, this is a very simple spreadsheet that we ask our administrators to um, identify and include in this spreadsheet a, a minimum of two goals based on the data of improvement. Again, we want to lead a culture of progress instead of culture of blame. And we want to make sure that we're celebrating our efforts and using the outcomes to learn and plan, and plan for what's next. Can we go to the next one? Thank you. So what's next? So the steps we are taking is an essential part of the process. Uh, part of the entire U Truth process. It's 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 essential. It's critical. Can we go to the next slide? This is uh, exciting. So I want to show you some examples of what uh, some of our uh, some of our schools are doing with the data. For example, Menlo Park Elementary School, when they were reviewing their their uh, their reports this year. Uh, the school notice concerns about students um, feeling, you know, feeling safe and bullying. Some concerns around uh, bullying and safety. Um, those questions came back with low, came back with low ratings. So the assistant principal, Mr. Nick Erickson, and uh, his counselor, Mr. Orchard, um, they are now co-teaching anti-bullying lessons for fourth and fifth graders. And they're actually starting to see, uh, to receive positive results, positive feedback. Um, one of them is now students are learning how to vocalize what's happening if something is happening, like learning to identify what's happening. And that allows the school, gives the school an opportunity to address um, what is going on before it gets, before it gets bigger. Earl Boyles Elementary School. So Earl Boyles, from last year's data, um, the question, do you feel safe in the bathrooms of the school? The average score was 2.22. Remember, at the elementary level, this goes one to three. So the Earl, uh, the Earl Boyles team investigated a little more and did some observations. And they realized that a large group of students were using the, the restrooms around the same time. Uh, just going to use the restroom and spending a lot of time um, playing. 
So what they did, they very simple system, they implemented a pass system. They also moved the academic functional skills um, classrooms to classrooms that have uh, restrooms or bathrooms within within the, the classroom. And I know that you know this seems very small, but when I was looking at the data and I was talking to the principal, we actually did notice, uh, we did see an improvement. It's not where we want to be, but we did see an improvement with this around this question for this year's uh, data. Now, Ron Russell Middle School. So at Ron Russell, they have different committees. Oh my God. They have different committees, and every committee meticulously reviews uh, different aspects of the data. So for example, the equity team is reviewing um, the DI responses, so you know, key measure. So one of their goals was to <clears throat> increase family communication, and uh, now teachers are more actively using Parent Square. And what I've been hearing from conversations with uh, one of the administrators is that the teachers are loving it because it has the ability to, to translate to the family's preferred language. The other goal that they have is um, uh, was to increase the percent positive of students who feel that they have a trusted adult in the building. So uh, the, oh, sorry. they are continuing to have sort of practice conversations. Um, they have social emotional learning lessons. And this year they have a, a, a new community partner, Elevate Oregon. Um, they have treatment agreements. Uh, they're doing empathy interviews with students and many more, many more steps uh, that I cannot name uh, just because of timing. Can we go to the next slide? Um, and I know I'm out of time, but I, I want to I wanna share this with everyone. So at the high school, they're focusing on their college and career readiness. So they are in the process of implementing, implementing the U Science platform. And I don't know if you are familiar with the U Science platform but it's basically, it gives high school students an opportunity to explore options, um, career options, higher education institutions, and trades. Um, it also has an aptitude test that allows students to expand their horizons. And what a great opportunity for, for the students to, to learn about their natural talents um, and what type of careers they can pursue with the, with their passion, based on their passions and interests. Um, and the goal would be, once implemented, um, this would be part of the advisory um, lesson, or curriculum, I should say, curriculum, and the CTE program's curriculum. And they're also continuing to work on their cultural responsive teaching practices and restorative practices. Can we go to the next slide? Um, I'm almost done, I promise. Um, our work is ongoing, you know, it's not done. <laughs> Um, we, you know, we, when we get the data, we analyze the data, we set goals, we, you know, we take actions, we evaluate, and we adjust, but most importantly, we remain steadfast in our pursuit of success, because we owe it to our students and our families. And with that, I conclude my presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thoughts, questions? quickly <laughs> go yeah um, I was wondering what there's a pretty massive disparity between uh, student results and parent results how how are the two different results collected and like how does it create such a huge gap yeah so um, at the elementary level if we can go back um, Sandy to maybe slide number five thank you um, for our students our students have the opportunity to take the survey during school during the school day so for example, at the high school, they have the opportunity to take it during advisory classes. Um, I know at the elementary level, they assign specific times to take the survey. And for families, um, you know, uh, our families, we are pushing out the communication to families and the families are taking the survey on their own. This is a computer-based uh, survey, so it's an online survey. Yeah, I remember we, uh, Mr. Uh, Pease at Floyd Light was pushing it pretty hard during one of their, their get-togethers, you know, which I appreciated. 
Yeah, and I know that our um, our elementary schools, um, the survey window aligned with uh, conferences, so they did have um, computers set up and staff members available to support the families. Um, and how, how, how available is this data? Like, can, can anyone take a look at this? Is it just district members, just board members? Like, who, who has access to this stuff? So um, for this data, so the, the posters that I, I showed you, that's going to go live. That will go live uh, on our website tomorrow, hmm. all of the posters. And we will also create a district-wide uh, general highlight report poster and I know last year uh, we did upload the U Truth reports it's a hundred plus pages to our website oh so that anybody from the general public can access it mm -hmm. if they want to uh, including the press or just like anybody yeah, yeah. all right thank you I, that's, I was really curious about that how, how do if, if like I was an average parent and I wanted to access it just take a look like what would I search on? Go would I just Google Youth Truth data results? If you, yeah, if you Google Youth Truth data result, it should show up. Um, and I, I can do a quick test. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, is there a what do you, what do you call it, Heather? Um, it does show up. Is is there a uh, like a sorting system built into the Youth Truth, so if someone does looking at it, they can kind of like, it, it looks like you really got to dial down on some really specific information in the presentation here, but is that, what do they call that, a console or a? Well, I think you mean if it's in database form, but I think we uploaded it in PDF form, so that's not searchable. Oh, okay. You can't, I mean, it might be already like in the, it's like hundreds of pages, the last document, so you would just go to the page that's stratified by race or stratified by whatever, school. Yeah, to correct, so to be able to uh, filter the data, or disaggregate data, we have to have access to the platform, to the dashboard. Okay, yeah. so, so I mean, people can see it, but it's not, it's just kind of in its raw form? Correct. All right, well, thank you so much. Thanks for uh, this presentation and all the work. I, I really appreciate it. Thank you. I have some questions. Um, some just general. So in terms of the high school, um, one thing that caught my eye right away was the number of data points is different on academic challenge. Why do we only have one year or two years? Is that, if you go to the slide that's the 2023 high school survey slide, mm -hmm. and we're looking at the, the percentile ranks of them, I'm looking at the trend data right next to it. Mm -hmm. and. I'm curious why academic challenge does not have eight years of points like the others do. Right. We only have t two points. Yeah, um, I don't have the answer f um, for you right now, Miss uh, Miss Franklin. Can I can yeah. I get back to you? Yeah, on yeah that? I'm just curious. Yeah. I'm wondering if Youth Truth is collecting different data. I saw you said like added these mm -hmm. areas in 19 and 21. So I'm curious mm -hmm. what's going on with academic challenge specifically. Yeah. Yeah, um, I'll get back to you on that if, if that's okay. I think, can you talk a bit about like the, so I'm, I'm familiar with the posters and I always am curious about how schools pick their targets out of all this, a lot of data, like you said, like mm -hmm. this is a lot of data to weed through. And I have some questions kind of in usefulness of mm -hmm. that much data, um, just as a as person that works with lot, large data sets. If we're only picking out a couple data points per school, I, this is maybe just ideological or I'm thinking return on investment. Like this is an expensive tool that we do annually and we pick out a couple points um, and it, it feels like to me that it's kind of up to the administrators of each school to pick their high points and their low points and then to set some goals around them. And then the rest of the data, I'm not ever sure what happens with it. So I'm, I'm curious mm. about kind of the usefulness compared to the, the cost of it um, and the accessibility of it also. So, you know, if there's points in there that are especially low, like I would say everything I see here on the high school is pretty depressing. Like we see downward trends on every measure. Um, there's, I don't see a single point in which I would say that eight years worth of investing in this tool has resulted in a, a, a point that looks like a shining star. And so I wonder about 
what is it res what does it do to collect this data if it, if it doesn't result in in those types of points and for me I always struggle with this youth truth data for for that reason um, but I'm I'm thinking about those posters and so if we set a target and this is the area that I think you showed that Cherry Park wanted to have that their highlights and their lowlights mm -hmm. like is there documents presented that are trends like this like we picked this target, and here's how we looked over the years after we set this as a school-wide goal. Hmm. You know, like to the communities that they're represent to these, you know, that are specific because they're they're important to each community that they're representing. But if they're just a point in time, what does it, what does it mean? You know, like for me, I have a hard time understanding what the value add is if it's just a point in time goal that isn't tracked over time to see those changes. You know, we look at graduation rates like that. We look at every other data point we look at is like, okay, is it going up or is it going down? And we don't, I don't see that with the, the translation. Mm -hmm. I see kind of like a pick and choose and then I don't know what happens year to year. So th those are some of my th thoughts. Um, and then I also just, with, like Aaron was saying, with the adult participation, the ones that are so low, the middle and high school levels, I'm not sure that they have much usefulness. Once you're into the under 20% marks, I'm, I'm not sure that those data are very useful. So I don't ever give them much substance either, and I just, I'm. Mm -hmm. I tend to agree. Well, another thing that, and it's a conversation we can have, right? We can workshop youth truth, and is this a good tool, or are there better tools? Because I feel like we get a, a lot of youth engagement in other ways and other things like on curriculum and, and things like that. So it just it's interesting to think about. I also kind of wonder about, um, oh, God, I just lost my thought. It's <laughs> almost 10. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was also around, oh, uh, my kids take this every year and have since they're like, well, whenever it started, 2018, 2019, and it's like the same questions every year, and we have to do it, and I don't get why, and some, I mean, I'm sorry, but they're a little older now, um, and they kind of play with the data because they're bored of it, they don't get it, and they don't think we use it. So, you know, like how accurate is it for a kid who's been in the same schools asking the same questions over eight years and then they get to middle school and they're like, yeah, nothing ever happens. They always make me do this. We have great rates, but is it really real? I don't know. Yeah, especially if <laughs> four years into this cohort and you're saying the same thing every year and it's not, you know. They're and they're the same much. questions. Yeah. And it's like kids are like, what's up with this? I have to do it every year and why, you know. And I wondered about that high school participation rate, too, because I believe last year it was near 100%. And now it's down to 77, so I'm wondering how many kids are just straight refusing to do it in advisory. If I, I could be wrong about that. I would feel that way if I had to answer the same questions many, many, many times, and I wasn't involved with the solution every year. But so, please, please defend youth truth. No, I, no, I, I can't do that. Um, <laughs> But I do want to point out that the state is requiring us to implement, as part of the state assessment program, a very similar survey. Uh, it's slightly different in terms of we don't, have, we don't have to require students to take it, but we are required to offer it. It's called the SEED survey. Um, it's much shorter than this. It's supposed to take something in the neighborhood of 15 to 20 minutes, but it is a school climate and culture kind of set of questions. And so we will be offering that to students in grades three through eight. 9, 10, and 11 um, this spring. So we'll, we'll see what kind of participation we get, but um, it looks like there could be a lot of overlap with the kind of information we get from Youth Truth. Is that an additional cost? Is that something we have to pay for? Or is the state providing that? No, I mean, I, we don't, um, I don't know exactly how the state's funding it. That, that's not part of the federal mandate. That's a, that's a state of Oregon requirement, kind of like the kindergarten assessment that we used to do. I don't know anything about what the cost is to the state. There's no additional cost to us. We just have, correct. Yeah, and it, it comes through the state testing program, so we will be reporting out on whatever results we get next year uh, on that seed survey as well. I think you did a great job, though. Yeah. Just this, has, this is a, a philosophical conversation <laughs> at 10 p.m. I would, sorry. No. I would think if, we were trying to track to see how we fare over years, it would be important to ask the same questions. Because if you change the questions every time, then you can't 
track it over time. So it's that, not it's not that part that yeah. I'm it's the if I'm a child and I'm asked the same question every year and I'm not involved in what happens afterwards, right? Or the solutions to this. Right. If it's not a collaborative process, then I would play with the data and be like, yeah, I get bullied all the time, or I, you know. Mm. I'm just saying not all kids are sitting there thoughtfully thinking about their school experience when they're forced to take this in advisory every year. But yes, of course you want to ask the same questions. Yeah. yeah. Um, kind of connected to that. What is the, like, how is it handled at the school level once the data comes back? Is there an, expect, an expected response to the data from the principals of each school or um, in terms of addressing it? And then what is the follow-up on whatever that decision is? So, like, does, is, is there something at the district level that looks at each building level and says, well, this is an issue at this school, this is an issue at this school, then there's a meeting to say, okay, how are we addressing that? And now I'm gonna follow up over whatever a time period on that. Is that a process that's in place or, or what exactly happens, I guess is a question. Yeah, so the process is in place. I don't know which slide it was, but it's a slide that has the dates and kind of the ideas. So what we did in general, put together expectations around reviewing it, circling back, um, the feedback loop and kind of those steps, establishing goals. The district doesn't go in or we as a cabinet go in and say, ooh, we see this, we want this to be your goal. We haven't gone to that level with this data yet. Mm -hmm. It's more building as you're saying, but there are definitely expectations, timelines and follow through. And Ida kind of talked about that one slide and it showed where we were at in that process, kind of updating and going through. Just real quick, backing up a little bit back to Heather's comments. All of that's real, Stephanie's comments in general, adolescents and surveys and all human beings and surveys I think is real, right? And I, I wanna say that one, the idea of year over year data we are interested in, but you're absolutely right. The wealth of data that's there and the reality of it, even Youth Truth tells us in the workshops we give for them, pick one or two, focus on those two because it is, it is massive amount of data. With that said, I will also say it's not something we're married to. If this board is saying, you know what, we aren't seeing the value, there is a cost, right? It's something we intentionally invested in. <laughs> It's something that we wanted to try to have year over year to lift student voice and to lift community voice. But if we truly feel like it's not having the impact, which is hard to measure necessarily, I can tell you we can go back over the years and look at targets that have been set. And we have had wins and we have had celebrations as well. This is just the initial data before we've gotten down into the weeds with it. But you're absolutely right. There's other areas where the trend line, okay, what did this do or not do? The only argument I would say, and this isn't a reason to keep it, is if we don't do it, we don't have the data, right? I mean, the data, you're right, it's not, not showing a good, but it's just as important to know that something's not working and we need to make some change in, in tempting that. And if we didn't have that, maybe we don't have that information. So I'd question that, wonder that, other than what Derek said, the state's gonna have a new opportunity, a new tool. Um, I believe also Gallup has a free, kind of it's a hope type of a, so there's other avenues. So if the board really wanted us to explore because of cost, a different avenue to do that, we could do that. The only, the only negative I would say is once we don't do it year over year, you know, it's gone, right? Now it's kind of, but if we're not seeing use of this, you know, we have one principal in the audience. I don't want to put her on the spot, but we could ask her. I think some principals use it part of their school improvement plan. So it's not just a added goal, but I'm sure they have many other student voice things they're doing. So if this went away, you know, we, it's not like, oh my gosh, what would we do? There's a lot of things we could do. So if I'm hearing the board really push, what are we doing in the, and again, right now we're talking money in a lot of conversations. So, sorry, I didn't mean that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Responding to that, I said, especially if after having eight years of this data and we know what the goals are, and if Minlo, for example, has established what they want to measure, they can come up with a survey that's much smaller that targets very specifically what that, you know, the bathroom issue is, for example. Um, so, yeah, it's just, just a thought. Do we know what kind of data that seed survey is going to give us? 
Yes, so we have samples of the questions that they're asking, and I was just sharing with, uh, with Stephanie that it's a very abbreviated version, uh, very similar kinds of questions around the, the kinds of experiences you're having. Are you experiencing bullying and harassment? Is your school a welcoming place? Do you, have, do you feel like adults are caring for you? It's a lot of the same kinds of things that we get at with um, Youth Truth, which is much more comprehensive I would say, but I'm happy to, I can, I can pull some of the sample questions that the state has given us and share that with you all if you'd like to get a, a taste of what they're going to be looking for. And again, we are required to offer it. So it won't be, we probably won't take the same approach we've used with Youth Truth, and I, I, I would expect considerably lower participation in this. It'll be at the end of the state testing window also. So kids will be it'll it, it'll be at the and, end of a long run for them and it'll be especially lower once they find out it's the exact same questions they've been doing. correct <laughs> correct uh, so we've been thinking about how do we explain this to students so that we can try to get some participation but i i have pretty low confidence that we're going to have substantial enough that we would see any actionable information from it yeah i don't think or at least it doesn't sound like that the to me at least, that the issue is as much about the instrument being used as what we decide to do with the information. No matter what instrument we use, whether it's free, whether we pay for it, whether it's the state or whatever, it's what is it that we do with that? I think that is the concern. What is our expectation from that? Um, and that it should be more, especially if we're making an, a financial, a significant financial investment I, I'm tempted to ask Pat to tell us the number, but I don't know that <laughs> I want to put you on the spot right now or that we're ready to hear it. <laughs> but, but if we're making that investment, then we want a response to the data. That's the thing that we're talking about. It's not a problem necessarily with just youth truth or whatever we're using, is what will we do with that information? How do we follow up on that? How do we use it so that it, in fact, is pushing us to be better and that we know we are better because of it? That we can say, well, five years ago we took this and we started working on that and now we took it again and this is where we are. If we're not doing that, then what's the point? I think, I think that's what I'm hearing. <laughs> from, right? um, anything else on this? Can I add a few things just to answer? Um, mm -hmm. I was having a conversation with one of our administrators at the high school, and we're having about Miss um, Stephanie what you what you brought up, and I know that this year they did had, um, they did have a conversation with the students before taking the survey and the importance of being truthful when answering um, the survey. So I just want to point that out. Um, last year, our high school students. Um, the response was 67%, and this year was 77. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, and and then for the posters, um, I, I I do think that we can do better. We can do better. Um, I do know when we are um, reviewing the the data reports online, the the first couple pages are before. Uh, before each key measure, uh, it gives us an overview of that key measure. And right at the beginning of the report, it tells us for your school, you know, 20, you know, whatever the school year is, your highest uh, key measures were da da da, and then your lowest da da da. So it does break the data a little, but I do think that we can do better. So I, I took notes. Um, Thank you, Ida. Okay. Um, we are going to move on to our consent agenda, which is an action item. Madam Chair, can I move? Can, I would like to move a consent agenda. Thank you. I'll second. Thank you. It's been moved and seconded to accept our consent agenda. Are there any questions? If not, um, let's move to a vote, starting with Stevens. Stevens, aye. Barrow, aye. Wynn, aye. Saldana Lopez, aye. Barber, aye. Gilmero Georgeson, aye. Franklin, aye. 
is so ordered, thank you. Um, and then we are at the point of our inter-district transfer recommendations for 24-25. And Mr. Long. Let's do it. Uh, in the spirit of time, I will go uh, quickly. Um, good evening, everyone. So this evening, um, in your documents, and you'll see it up on the screen, you'll see the inter-district transfer recommendations uh, for the 24-25 uh, school year. And as you know, per Oregon state law, each year the board does determine the number of students we release um, from our district and then the number of students we allow to transfer in to our districts from other districts around us. Um, and as you can see in the second paragraph there, um, the recommendation we have is the same that it's been in previous years. And that is, um, let's not put a limit on the number of um, students we let into our district and let's not put a limit on the number of students going out. And really we have two reasons for that recommendation. One of them is that we feel like um, our families know what's best for our children and we want to give them that choice uh, to make. And then secondly, this decision has um, a history of helping us with our enrollment. Um, you'll see on the screen or in your document how many current interdistrict transfers we have attending David Douglas, and that's um, 290 um, that are attending us on a current interdistrict transfer, or they were renewals from previous years. So that's 290 students, and um, versus the amount of students we have going out this year, which is 155. So that's a difference of about 135 students. Um, coming into David Douglas. So that shows that our process doesn't really affect our enrollment in a negative way. And it actually helps our enrollment, which is something we really need right now. Um, so that is the recommendation. Um, and Chair Barber, I'll turn it back over to you for your recommendation. Are there any questions concerning transfer? Well. <laughs> no. Okay, if not, this is also an action item. So can I have a motion? Uh, everyone's looking at me again. So <laughs> Madam Chair, I will <laughs> move <laughs> approval of this action item, the interdistrict transfer recommendations for 2425. Oh, and I can, I'll second. It's been moved and seconded to accept the recommendation for interdistrict transfer for 2425. Are there any questions? If not, then we will move to vote. Franklin. Franklin, aye. Governor Gerson, aye. Barber, aye. Saldana Lopez, aye. Wynn, aye. Vera, aye. Stevens, aye. Great. It is so ordered. Thank you. And moving on to our bond update, Pat Comer. Thank you. So uh, we'll try to be quick tonight, but our CTE center uh, actually got the date scheduled. I believe it's the first Saturday in May for groundbreaking. And they were working on hiring short and long-term student interns to work on the project. We have our North Powhurst renovations that um, are in process. We are waiting as usual for permits at the city for most of our projects. Um, including the uh, house that needs to be demoed next to Gilbert Heights. We did have a little glitch with Cherry Park. They had designed um, and specified some HVAC units to go in some closets that, um, and to utilize some acoustical material to um, quiet them. And uh, they are actually larger than the spaces. So I'm not sure exactly how we managed that. Um, so we're going back and uh, we rechecking those. Uh, so I tried to remind them, measure twice, cut once. <laughs> um, middle school track project, <laughs> yeah, basics. Um, I think they measured the units and then they said, oh, they, they're a little loud, we need some acoustical material. And then I think, yeah, so we're gonna try that again. Um, middle school track project and football field are going 
and we actually just got um, some designs for the football turf installation and are finalizing those. So we are in process with the architects on um, Mill Park renovations for Ridge renovations, West Powhurst, Floyd Light, South Powhurst, and the high school phase two for next summer. Um, we have our next bond oversight committee meeting next week, and they'll be here next month to present. Great, thank you. It's good to see things moving along. Hopefully we'll work out the air conditioner issues. <laughs> um, reflections on public comment. Mm. Yeah, I, I wanted to, um, I wanted to, uh, I, I had some thoughts around our counseling staff and they came in and gave some beautiful testimony, brought me to uh, tears at one point. I think that was kind of more than me. Um, she was good. Well, I don't remember her name, but the second to last counselor speaker. I do, I want to say uh, two things. I do uh, work in uh, counseling myself and I work in a bureaucratic system and I do experience like the overwhelming uh, amount of paperwork and emails and other crap uh, navigating bureaucracy that takes me away from doing the real one-on-one, -on -one, heartfelt, connected work that makes such a big difference in people's lives. Um, and it, I also want to say, though, on the same token, uh, as a parent of a student who is in, in the midst of a, a blooming 504 plan, I am just super grateful to the uh, counselor at Floyd Light who is orchestrating the plan and creating something that creates a bridge between her and uh, the teachers that spend so much time and energy and, and life with one of my kids. And I just acknowledging that it takes a community to really uh, create um, change and growth when it comes to mental health challenges and and so I also want to acknowledge our counselors uh, work creating a bridge between what they do and the teaching staff that that spend so much time touching the lives of our kids so that really uh, was very touching and I appreciated uh, everything they had to share today I, I wanted to say one more thing is, is it okay um, I I want to issue an apology Going back a year, uh, last year, our aut autistic teacher came in and shared specifically uh, that she, or they, um, appreciate being um, referred to as an autistic person. And I immediately um, talked about that afterwards and said, people who struggle with aut autism. And so I, I apologize to her personally. Or, her, him, I, I apologize. I apologize to them personally, but I wanted to uh, offer a general apology to the autistic, autistic community for not uh, listening to what they had to say and actually taking that on one board and, um, and, and really, um, yeah, understanding that truth. I, I do want to say that having someone, uh, an autistic teacher in our community who's doing so much good is just it's amazing uh, there's so much stigma around mental health i think it's 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 kind of a constant um in society and to have them bring that perspective to our school and to help combat that stigma on the ground level and help those students be more engaged um really it warms my heart and it it helps me uh, as a member of the neurodivergent community also be uh, more ready to just talk about the stuff that I'm going through when I when I hear them talk about the things that they've gone through and what they're doing to support kids who are learning to thrive and grow um, in our community. Um, so uh, again, a lot of appreciation, and uh, I really, you know, I just really just wanted to say that. So, thank you. Re really quick, Teacher Hannah uses they, them, so you know. Okay. Teacher Hannah uses they, them. Oh, uh, thank you for the uh, clarification. If you don't know, you need to ask, right? So uh, thank you, Teacher Hannah, again, <laughs> for, for coming in tonight. 
Madam Chair, I do have something, mm -hmm. and I'm not going to say it well. I apologize, but, you know, um, we heard testimony tonight from our union mm -hmm. and representing teachers, and, um, you know, I'm one of several people on the board who sits at the bargaining table, um, and it's hard. Mm -hmm. I feel like um, it, we have a culture of mutual respect here, and... Um, and, you know, we don't talk in this meeting about who said what, right? <laughs> if I could speak on behalf of the board if for an apology from us for any feeling that any educator had that was disrespect, um, I, 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 that's heavy. That's a lot to carry. And I just want um, our educators to hear from me an apology for... Um, for that. Thank you. Um, you I, I just was going to follow up. We had a community member come from uh, Floyd Light. She's a coach in, uh, in our community. And I just wanted the board to hear we are aware of that. We did put up signs. But she asked a specific question. Mm -hmm. And that specific question, what else can we do? Because it kind of feels like, okay, I'm there. It's after hours. I can call police. And I don't have a great answer. But the one thing I wanted to communicate for whoever's watching it, and we will get back and call her as well, is, is the follow-up. So one is absolutely anytime you don't feel safe, you can call police. But the follow-up the next day or that evening with the school, with the principal, with the administration, we have an amazing facilities department. We can get them involved. You know, is there a need for a different gate? Or, you know, we, she's talking specifically Floyd Light. We don't have a fence around it, so I don't know much would help other than more signage, but we want to be aware. We want to look and monitor. There's also cameras. Um, they don't always work in the best places, et cetera, but sometimes they might catch something that helps us. Years ago, we had a situation where uh, a young man was riding a motorcycle, and because of a camera, we identified who that was, and we could call the parents and say, hey, can you help us with this? They can't be riding around like this, et cetera, et cetera. So I just, I just want to hear, I want to, we'll follow up with Mrs. Rhodes um, around, you know, we aren't just shrugging our shoulders. We'll try to think about, listen, learn, and get better. Um, but always, I hope that there'll not only be a call to police or others, but a follow-up with our building so we can follow up and help. I did ask her to email me directly. I said, if she's on the field and somebody's misusing it, to please contact police and then email me so that we could let them know too. I'd like to flag a concern that's been brought to my attention by the, uh, the members of the Floyd Light community and staff is that many of those cameras, seven out of I think 18, uh, are malfunctioning or don't work. And so when situations like this happen, I mean, we only can, it, it, we can only pay for so much manpower, but those cameras add an exponential amount of manpower to uh, what we can afford uh, as far as uh, safety goes. And I'd like to, to do some brainstorming around how we can get those cameras uh, functioning. Are the, the cameras not working due to just like they're old or, uh, or are they being vandalized or do we know? I don't have a report in front of me, but it's all of the above. I mean, there are some that get vandalized sometimes. There's some that get stolen. Um, I think that's been a while because the cameras are fairly old, but we've actually had, they're just gone. Um, and then there's some that are breaking and um, dying. And yeah, so it's all of, all of those things. Is that part of any of our bond stuff that's already that on was the list not, somewhere? Okay. No. Um, as we're doing our safety and security standards, we are looking at that as a part of that. Mm -hmm. um, and we actually um, just sat in on another grant that may have an opportunity to use some of it for those types of purposes. So we're exploring that. Mm -hmm. But yeah, there's quite a few that I think um, we bought them as I started. <laughs> and so they are at kind of end of life and yeah. we need to start the replacement cool okay thank you um i just had a couple of clarifying questions with um the public comment um and this was had a lot to do with what we heard from our counselors are the the duties that were described around the paperwork for our special ed students is 
that supposed to be somebody else's job? Or is that, is that not, and I guess because in my mind, it is, it does go to the counselors, but maybe that's <coughs> not accurate. Is it supposed to rest somewhere else and it's just falling on them? Um, is there supposed to be like a social worker position that we haven't been able to fill due to budget constraints or whatever that where it would, would lie? Or is it not being included in the job description at the hiring? I guess I was just a little confused as to how that could be like so often felt like I'm doing something I'm not supposed to do. Do you have any input, Florence, on that? <laughs> oh, Florence oversees our our counselors, um, so she uh, intimately knows about this, yeah, and oh, student yeah. services as well. It's a long story. <laughs> Lots of history there. Um, as Sean had mentioned, the it's been in place probably like since the mid '80s. Um, <clears throat> our staffing has varied over years and the counselors have been consistent folks. Um, in order to do the pre-evaluation process, it needs to be done by like not, a, we don't wanna make a predetermination that the kid is going to qualify for SPED. And part of that process is you go through and you collect intervention data and um, you look at all the pieces and then if you decide that you need to proceed with special education services or you think that they may qualify, you do evaluation testing. That is the part our counselors kind of manage is that academic support piece leading up to the evaluation and then it transfers over once an eligibility is made. Um, we have tried to hire school psychologists um, to replace that task um, that the counselors have been doing for the last 20-ish, 30-ish, 40-ish years. Um, and it's just, we have not been successful in hiring them. Um, I had gone to the counselors um, for the last few years and trying to figure out like, okay, more counselors, more school psychs, like how do you guys want me to navigate the conversation around what happens next to support this? Um, and it was school psychs, school psychs. So we've been trying, we've tried interns. I mean, you guys have heard that whole story um, for quite some time and have not been successful. So we haven't been able to transfer the work to somebody else yet. Um, it is our long-term plan with the hope of filling those positions, but it, we're just not there. Um, in meeting with the counselors, they did share with me that the, the, job, does, the job description itself does need to be updated. Um, there are pieces that just haven't been, we haven't updated the job description in many, many years. Um, and ODE has put out new standards around counseling framework. Um, the Association of School Counselors also has components that um, we want to follow and reach towards that model. Um, so it's a little bit of both. It's yes, job description, yes, staffing, yes, some of that. Does that answer your question? Yes, and, and so we can, we have the freedom in terms of what goes in the job description. None of that is dictated by the state of Oregon. Correct. We write our own job descriptions. We are the, um, we are the only um, district that does have our counselors do that SPED pre-referral process that they were referring to. Okay. Um, that's important to me. Can I Piggyback on your question. Mm -hmm. So if you did update that job description, though, to include SPED duties, like writing a 504 plans, what does that mean in terms of pay equity? Because that's like you'd have to reclass people, I would imagine, based on that different l that level of work, that type of work. Certified positions, their job descriptions look a little bit different than our classified where we did the pay equity. Certified is certified, follows the same rubric that everybody else does. Um, 504s, I, I want to separate those two. 504s are the responsibility of school counselors. Um, it is an or like an ODE suggestion. Um, every counselor in Oregon does do 504s, but the separation is the special education part of the work that other counselors in the area do not do. Okay, that's what I was confused about because they kept, ref I, I kept hearing 504, which I thought was a counselor's job. Mm -hmm. um, but and that I, is he in would the job be. description. 
The 504 is in the job. The 504 is in the job description. So at the point of hire, they know that that's part of. Okay. Correct. And you said we're the only district that they do this function. Who does it in all the other districts? It varies. Um, school psychologists, um, sometimes they have um, another member um, of like the um, student intervention team um, who may run it or it, I, like I, there, I think it, I haven't asked specifically, but I know it's not counselors. <laughs> I guess I want to add to the question really is, yes, the job description, but is has there been an increase of evaluations from students? I think that's become a workload issue, correct? Oh, absolutely. We have identified more students already this year than we did last year at this point in time. We've identified more students last year than we did the previous year. Like, there is definitely an increase in the number of evaluations that um, we are doing. Thank you. I wonder if there are like um, supports that would that would they could help them at least with the amount of the paperwork. Uh, I, I I'm just, just spitballing, but like using AI uh, to write briefs or <laughs> you know speech to text software or having hiring an assistant that that just really specializes in banging out paperwork. I I'm not really sure. That sounds like a financial and budget implication. So I will let somebody else answer that. <laughs> I think thinking creatively and having an understanding, um, just real quickly with AI, because it is something, one of the things is how do you use it to relieve time? But one of the things we're hearing right now is most AIs, you got to be very careful because they're open systems. So if you start putting information on there, although it's not intentionally broadcasting out, it is available out because that's how generative AI works is it takes all the information and learns from that. Mm -hmm. So if you put anything that's specific to students in a generative AI model, again, way above my pay grade here, <laughs> but that's a no-no. You want to be very careful about that. There are closed AI systems as well, um, but just, just throwing that out there, that's something I've learned in recent conferences that um, although it sounds like a great because you can say, Put this in here, this in here, this in here, and it will ty literally type an IEP for you. But if you do that in certain models, that now is not necessarily public, but it's out there for people to access, and obviously that's not good. Ken, you are a certified nerd. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. That's true. But I still don't I, know what I'm talking about. I do want to add that um, Sean had met one of the counselors who had spoken, kind of, um, kind of joked around, like, you know, they're... They're, they're doing clerical pieces. Some of the um, pieces are our information system. We use Synergy to do that pre-referral paperwork to start the process. It's a lot of clicking. It's a lot of like marking the right boxes, typing in the right information from the meeting that took place. Um, so while AI can be an asset, like you know Ken described and kind of the caution of that, there are, with this particular piece, I don't know how that would integrate. It needs to be like a body who's like clicking boxes and working through the system. All right. Um, in consideration of time, unless somebody has something very pressing, I would like to skip past our committee reports tonight and go very pressing. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Well, okay, in response to my request for a tech committee, Ida has, and her team have done a, a ton of work um, to put together our first three listening sessions this month. Yeah. At the end of the month, uh, Tay's actually kicked in grant money to provide food uh, for families and for educators and whoever comes out to provide feedback. Please help me spread the word. First one's going to be on April 25th at Alice Ott. It's going to be from 6 to 7.30. Second one's going to be at the high school. And I want to make sure I'm getting the time right. It's from 11.30 to 1 o'clock. All right. Um, and the last one's going to be at Ron Russell, also uh, 6 to 7.30. And why didn't I write down the dates for the other two? Good Lord. <laughs> I know the third one's on the 30th. Second one, I believe, is on the 26th. The high school's at the 26th. The third is at Ron Russell on the 30th. Um, what we're going to do is, uh, the general idea is we're going to collect a lot of concepts, things that uh, stakeholders are thinking about when it comes to tech and really would like to have addressed uh, policy-wise or, or just at some point. Mm -hmm. And then next year, we're going to take these concepts that are being collected in the listening sessions 
and we're going to create a committee that's actually going to parse out the different concepts and try to get more nuanced conversations. So eventually we can bring recommendations to the board for our future actions. So that's kind of like what's in process. But that, I guess, I, yeah, it is immediate because it's going to be at the end of this month. I want to get as many people, like millions of people, to millions show up. Millions of people. Yeah. <laughs> That'd be great. But what was the time for Ron Russell? Uh, Ron Russell is going to 6 to 7.30. 6, okay. Yes. Yeah, yeah. All right. Thank you. And thank you, all the people that are making this happen. Yes. Woo. All right, our finance report. So last month, we talked a little bit about the implications of unemployment on our budget um, as we prepare for next year. And uh, uh, there was a question regarding, well, what's the difference between like making somebody full, full year versus the unemployment? So you can see average cost. Um, I just used a bus driver and an elementary secretary, um, 12 to $13,000 to make them full year. Um, a reminder, they do get full year benefits already. So it's really just the cost of the salary and the employer costs. Why is the ratio different? Why is what? Why are the ratios different? Like the increase is 13 to 13.5 right. and then 12 to, and you want the little half. So, right, a bus driver is um, around 190 days. A school secretary is 220. Mm -hmm. So it's... Oh, small. small. Yeah. Okay. So... Um, but, but that's not what I mean. Why? So 5.5 5 .5 to 12 is about half as much, right? Like half mm -hmm. unemployment is about half as much as going full time for a secretary, and it's about a, a fourth of as much, it's about 25%. Right? Mm -hmm. Can you say that again? What does that have to do with the days? It has to do with the number of days they work, and their different salaries, they're on different salaries. Oh, and the unemployment caps. Right. Okay. Got it. Yeah. So, and I'm just going to talk a little bit about general fund tonight. So we're starting to see um, uh, Oregon Department of Education push out the information for May adjustments. So for 22-23, they sent out some preliminary information. Um, there is a small increase in statewide ADMW for that year. Um, we also, um, I needed to make a correction for our transportation costs. Um, as we know, we've struggled to hire drivers. And so um, our actual costs for last year were a little less than what I had anticipated. And I actually am making a correction for this year. Um, I will submit that tomorrow. Um, which will result in uh, a reduction in state school fund. So at five o'clock tonight, I got high cost disability um, and I've got a little bit of glance at that. We do have a $300,000 correction on uh, the 22-23 actuals for that. And so if you recall, that's pretty typical and um, I believe that uh, it will actually um, even out with this year's and um, high cost disability estimate that we're getting paid. So between the two, it'll net what I've got in the budget. Um, I'll double check that tomorrow. So, but I do anticipate that we're gonna see things tighten up and it'll be important that um, we're looking at the data more frequently, especially with our financial situation. Any questions? I don't have good news.
what that looks like uh, exactly, I'm not sure um, because of space, there's a lot of different flags, but we are definitely open. Let's talk and what does that look like? So I just in case and we'll bring you more information as we know. The second thing specifically related to cyclical monitoring and I will email you a memo tomorrow so you'll have it in writing but I wanted to have a little face time on this and I, I'm going to ask uh, Florence as well just to share right now we don't have all the information we have very initial information but that ni initial information is going to cause change within our district so just want to flag it for you we'll send the memo tomorrow for you um, and then it will also be ongoing so there's not a lot of data and I'll specifically share what cyclical monitoring and what I'm talking about right now Florence will share with you. Yeah. ODE is part of um, ensuring that students with disabilities are supported. Um, they go through a monitoring process every year it looks a little bit different. Um, it is currently called cyclical monitoring and with cyclical monitoring, what we did was we evaluated um, internally um, 80 files that we randomly selected based on criteria from ODE. Um, ODE provided us scoring guides in um, uh, three areas that we used, least restrictive environment, which is ensuring that we are providing services um, as close to as possible the gen ed setting. Um, and then the next one was on secondary transition. So any kiddo with, um, who's 16 or older needs to have transition goals on what post high school outcomes could look like and what they wanna do. And then um, the third area, just on writing an IEP, like the components of an IEP to make sure that everything is covered. Um, there, our initial findings show that we have a lot of work to do around um, ensuring that all of the pieces that we need to do to support kids are in place. We are, are planning on using the information that we got back to plan trainings for next year and doing a lot of side-by-side -side coaching um, with our special education case managers to ensure that they are implementing all of the pieces as part of the IEP. Um, a second layer to cyclical monitoring um, is something called SPR and I. It's um, basically a performance review. That has been happening for years. The cyclical monitoring is new. We are in cohort B. They started last year and every year they keep tweaking it so it looks a little different. With SPR and I, there's a couple of indicators that we did not meet in and that is historical data that we didn't meet. Um, and so additional information will be in the information that Ken sends out. One of them was on excluding um, students with disabilities for, at higher rates than we do gen ed for 10 or more days. Um, and then the second one that we were flagged and again, it's like three years we have done not met the target and that's what the um, threshold is, um, is on child find specifically on did we finish um, evaluations within the 60 day timeline. Um, we kind of have a 100% compliance with, with all of these pieces and we did have two IEPs that um, did not meet that, that timeline. So we have to, um, this year, or last year, this is a year ago, so it's basically four years ago's history. Um, so we have two IEPs that we did not meet, so we have to present um, information to the state on how we ensure that this isn't gonna happen again next year. I have an interview with ODE to review all of the things scheduled for next week. We'll get final findings from ODE around our cyclical monitoring in the middle of May, and then we will plan and get you guys additional information on what that looks like. And that's my report again. I just wanted to flag that. Obviously, Florence has flagged it with us. We actually, in labor management, talked about it a little bit with our union president as well. So there's just, there's work to be done there. We know that. There's, uh, anyway, so with all that said, I just wanted to bring it to your attention here rather than just in an email. So, but we will follow up with a memo as well and keep you in the loop. There's a, nothing else. We are adjourned.